Next, standards for medical devices. The House Government Reform and Oversight Committee held a hearing Thursday on how the Food and Drug Administration enforces standards for medical devices. They also look at proposals to change the medical device evaluation Hearing will come to order. Uh, this joint hearing continues our oversight of the Food and Drug Administration's regulation of medical devices. We begin this inquiry with a hearing. We began this inquiry with a hearing August 1st, focusing on risk assessment standards for breast implants and biomaterials. Today, we focused on FDA enforcement standards, particularly the important issues raised by the Indiana medical device manufacturers in their recent petition. We have asked our witnesses to address the following questions. How does the FDA establish enforcement standards for medical device regulations? What factors determine the use of informal versus formal procedures to promulgate enforcement standards? How consistently are those standards applied? How does the FDA guard against selective or arbitrary enforcement? And most importantly, what are the effects of current FDA device approval and enforcement policies on patient outcomes and public health? Underlying all these questions is the need for balance. Balance between the medical risks and benefits of new devices. Balance between the pace of technological advances and the capacity of regulatory systems. And balance between global market realities, governmental, government authority, and the right of patients to make their own health care decisions. Any loss of equilibrium costs lives. People will die if unsafe and ineffective devices reach the marketplace, just as patients die when life-saving devices are not available due to primarily bureaucratic roadblocks. So today we hear from the FDA, device manufacturers, and industrial analysts on how to achieve and maintain that essential balance in the face of rapid technological process progress, relentless foreign competition, and tight federal budgets. We look forward to testimony from all our witnesses and to working with all of them in evaluating proposals to reform the regulatory regulation of medical devices. This is a joint hearing uh, between the, the, the subcommittees on human resources and intergovernmental relations and the subcommittee on national economic growth, natural resources, and regulatory affairs. And before asking the chairman, uh, Mr. McIntosh, of that committee to speak, I invite my ranking member, Mr. Towns, uh, to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this hearing, which continues the Human Resources and National Economic Growth Subcommittee's oversight of the FDA. The issue of enforcement standards for medical devices has been the source of great concern within the medical device community. The specific concern is that the FDA has abdicated its responsibility under the Administrative Procedure Act to provide for public participation when developing substantive regulations. These concerns are set forth in the Indiana Medical Device Manufacturers Council Citizens Petition File with the FDA. In the petition, the IMDMC alleges that the FDA has created substantive policy through informal mechanisms such as press releases and speeches, and in so doing has violated the notice and comment requirement of the APA. The IMDMC further contends that such informal policy pronouncements have been the basis for enforcement actions against medical device manufacturers, many of whom have not been given notice of the policies being enforced. If it's true that the FDA is violating the APA, then some action must be taken to prevent this from occurring in the future. We cannot have federal agencies issuing substantive policy in speeches and then turning around and basing an enforcement action on the contents of a speech. However, I do not believe that requiring notice and comments for all rules including interpretive rules, is a proper solution. My concern is that such a requirement would greatly lengthen the medical device approval process. In addition, let me point out 
that requiring notice and comment for all rules must be a severe drain on FDA resources, and I understand that, as greater funding would have to be dedicated to the notice and comment process. In a time of belt tightening within the government, less funding would be available for the review of pre-market approval applications and enforcement activities. As a result, this could further lengthen the time it takes to receive FDA approval of not only medical devices, but of drugs, biologic, foods, additives, and the like. Mr. Chairman, as you well know, the FDA cannot afford to enact measures that would lengthen the already protracted pre-market approval period. Today, the subcommittee will also examine the human cost of delays in medical device approvals of, at the FDA. Our consideration of this issue corresponds to the release of a report on the subject by the Hudson Institute. As I indicated earlier, in the interest of coherence, I would appreciate our witnesses tying the issues together, enforcement standards issues. I would like, I would look forward to hearing witness testimony on the report in addition to an assessment of the conclusions drawn. Mr. Chairman, I, again, I thank you for calling this hearing, and I anticipate both an engaging and constructive discussion because it is needed, and uh, the sooner the better. Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. McIntosh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, let me say I appreciate you holding these joint hearings. I think they are tremendously helpful in this area, and I'm glad that we can be of assistance in holding them jointly with you. Past hearings before the subcommittee have focused on a little-known fact that every American needs to understand. Put simply, many of the FDA policies are leading to people in America dying as a result. At today's hearing, we will take it a step further and expose the fact that FDA has adopted a policy-making process that acts in secret to support those policies. The evidence to support these facts is compelling. In June, at a field hearing in Vice Chairman Fox's district in Norristown, Pennsylvania, this subcommittee heard from a number of sick and dying Americans who complained that the FDA was standing between them and life-saving products. Heroic people like Mariah Gladys, who suffers from ALS, the same disease that killed Lou Gehrig 50 years ago. You know, this month Cal Ripken broke Lou Gehrig's record for the most consecutive games played, but Mrs. Gladys still suffers from ALS and is still waiting for action. Shortly after our hearing last June, the FDA did take action on the drug Rilutec, and it significantly broadened the application of that drug to fight that disease. Unfortunately, it took time, and Mrs. Gladys's condition deteriorated. For those of you who weren't there, you can imagine the sadness that I felt watching her raise her arm to swear in to be able to give her testimony and having to depend upon her husband in order to take that oath because of her frailty. There are also heroic people like Kiyoshia Kurimaya, who is struggling to survive AIDS, and came and asked us that we speed FDA approval of drugs that could save his life. And heroic people like the little girl who came before the joint hearing we had last time, asking that FDA take action on the question of silicone so that she can be assured there'll be a replacement shunt when time comes for her to receive that operation. Today, we will start hearing about new facts, facts developed by the Hudson Institute on the attempt to qualify and quantify the effect of FDA's failure to act expeditiously in approving new medical devices. In just one example, 2,888 Americans have died needlessly because of FDA lengthy approval procedure for a coronary stent. Today, the coronary stent is used as a safe and effective emergency procedure when an artery collapses during angioplasty. Since the FDA approved the stent, tens of thousands of Americans have benefited from this device and are still alive. We will also hear today from a group of medical device manufacturers in my home state of Indiana who are here to tell us about a process in which FDA develops policies that are not published for comment. And have the, they have taken the action to petition the agency to end this bad habit of developing guidance documents in secret and require them to return to the policy 
that published those for comment and consensus among the regulated community. In documents just released by the agency, we have learned that the Administrative Conference of the United States, a nonpartisan federal agency, warned them back in 1990 that it was flirting with a dangerous habit to change its procedures in that area. Unfortunately, the agency did not listen, and the result has been a slowdown in the approval of devices as a result. In 1992, the FDA announced the first time that it was keeping a secret list of manufacturers that it was going to deny approvals under the 510K process. Although the FDA claims it has stopped using that list, I continue to believe it's important that we revert back to the earlier process of public proceedings in order to develop those type of procedures. I'm anxious to hear from the FDA, to hear their explanations for their policies and their comments on the citizens' position, petition. Although their citizens' petition focuses on an intricate aspects of administrative law that even, frankly, most lawyers don't fully understand, we all must understand the consequence of one thing. It is a plea that the FDA follow the simple rule of law of consulting those who will be affected by their actions. It is not hard to see how their failure to do so has been debilitary in this area. According to a study by Weiss, Weiss, Price Waterhouse, fully 75% of the manufacturers recently surveyed believe that FDA's policy on guidelines had either no positive impact or actually hindered the approval of new life-saving medical devices. If this hearing accomplishes one thing, Mr. Chairman, I hope it sends a clear signal to FDA and to the commissioner and to the employees who are serving in that agency that we must change a direction in this country. We must realize that there is a cultural problem that leads to a bureaucratic inaction in cases where lives are at stake. Second, we must understand that failure to act to approve devices and other medical products will take lives and that there is a cost to, to agency in action. So I would call upon FDA to speed up its initiatives, to simplify the regulatory approval process of medical devices, adopt changes requested by the citizens' petition regarding the use of guidance documents. As preliminary steps towards that end, I would urge them to publish in the Federal Register a notice regarding the citizens' petition, schedule a conference on the petition so that public comments can be formally received and considered by the agency, before it acts, obey the law that requires it to act on petitions within 180 days of filing. In this case, the deadline is October 28th, and it is fast approaching. And finally, drop secret policies or those that have been developed without a full public notice and comment proceeding to ensure that the agency is not acting in a way that unnecessarily threatens the health and safety of the American public. In closing, I hold much hope that the serious problems identified in this and earlier hearings will be solved by the many good people inside FDA. If they, but however, they cannot solve their problems on their own. They do need the advice and the input from those who are working in these fields, from patients who will benefit from the products that they are considering, from the experts at places like the Hudson Institute and the Progress and Freedom Foundation, and from people here in Congress who have a great interest in making sure that the right thing is done. I have no doubt that if that happens, we can solve these problems and break out of the command and control mindset, stop setting policies in secret, and work together to put these new technologies to work to save American lives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Peterson. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Shays. I want to commend you and Chairman McIntosh for, uh, for your tenacity and <clears throat> continuing to hold these hearings. I frankly have to tell you that we keep uh, holding hearings, uh, especially in our committee, on regulatory reform, and we've had a couple of hearings on the FDA uh, field hearings and others. And uh, the more we get into this, I, I hate to say this, but I, can, I actually some days get more skeptical about whether we're ever going to make any progress or changing this psychology that you talked about within these regulatory agencies. But I guess uh, probably the way to <clears throat> deal with it is to keep having hearings and keep the pressure on. And so I commend you for. Uh, for doing that, um, uh, I've got an opening statement that I'd like to uh, submit for the record. I'm not going to uh, read the whole thing. I just uh, 
I might just take the opportunity then to ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered and the gentleman may continue. Well, I just uh, hope that we can, uh, you know, that we can do some good with these hearings uh, to, to try to, you know, the problem is not just with the FDA. We have problems with other agencies that are similar. Uh, in nature, uh, my staff, when we're out in my district working on economic development, the, the biggest problem we run into sometimes is not the adverse decisions from these agencies, that you can't get a decision from them at all. And, uh, and you know, the, a lot of times it seems to me that the very agencies that we've set up to solve some of these problems in effect uh, cause more problems uh, than, uh, than we had to start with. So uh, somehow or another, we've got to get this regulatory process changed I am committed to uh, doing whatever we can to, to make that happen. I again commend you for holding these hearings and apologize. I'm going to have to leave. Uh, we've got Farm Bill stuff going on and typical around this place there's too many things happening. But uh, commend you for your leadership and uh, hope we uh, have some positive outcome. Well, I thank you, gentlemen. I might take the opportunity to say that uh, my two colleagues to the right were chairman of, of the two basic subcommittees uh, th that are now hearing uh, uh, this issue and uh, we really had uh, started that process and so this is really a continuation of what Mr. Towns has done and uh, Mr. Peterson in other areas as well when you were chairing the committee that I now chair. Um, Mr. Sauter, you've been very patient. You were first here and I thank you and welcome any statement you'd like to make. I don't have a statement. I want to commend uh, our subcommittee chairman uh, for his uh, persistence to and oversight and and uh, patience that he goes through and, and we make sure we hear all sides. I'm particularly excited today that we have uh, Hoosiers representing the legal profession, representing the business profession, and uh, think tank. Uh, and I'm proud of our home state today, too. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to uh, welcome our first panel. Our first panel is uh, uh, testimonies from William Schultz, the Deputy Commissioner for Policy at the FDA, and accompanied by Dr. Bruce Burlington, uh, Mr. Ronald Cheesemore, and Miss uh, Ann Wyan. And uh, if you would come forward, uh, and did I leave anyone else out? Is there anyone else coming forward? Um, we're going to swear in all the witnesses, and that that's our practice, whoever they are. And uh, uh, they're welcome to come forward, and if they'd remain standing, uh, I'll swear in our witnesses. This is the practice in our investigative committee. Sorry. If you want to be on either side, is that, does this work out all right? Okay. Is there anyone else that you want to accompany you, Ms. Charles? If you would, if you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Swear or affirm. Thank you very much. Uh, may I uh, note for the record that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative and welcome you to sit down. Um, and if I also at this point could uh, ask uh, uh, unanimous consent that our witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record uh, and without objection so ordered. We really have one witness accompanied by, uh, by others who may uh, help you respond, Mr. Schultz. And um, what I'd like to just say for the record is that we invited, uh, uh, um, we invited uh, um, the FDA to uh, stay and uh, respond uh, after panel two uh, had spoken and, and they've declined and I candidly just learned about uh, that, that uh, decision not to, to stay. And, and I'm going to respect that today, but I do want to say for the record that this committee reserves the right to have an agency come either in the beginning, the middle, or the end. Uh, it is uh, today you're coming first, but it, sometimes it's very helpful for an agency to, uh, to respond after others have made uh, comments and where an agency isn't prepared to answer because they don't you know, have the answer given it might be new information and so on. We would always respect the, the agency not, uh, uh, not responding. But I just want to put on the record that uh, uh, the FDA was invited to stay and has declined and we'll respect that uh, today, but uh, we'll reserve in the future our right to have them come at any time. And uh, uh, I'd like to welcome before, if Ms. Schultz, you make your statement, to welcome our colleague from Pennsylvania and ask if he has any any comments? A statement for the record? Uh, yes, you're, I may. To, you're certainly welcome to. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I am pleased to, that you have organized today's hearing on the important issues regarding FDA medical device regulation and to uh, recognize your leadership 
uh, in the Congress and this committee in that regard. Uh, since its inception in 1938, regulation of the medical device industry by the FDA has increased in scope, detail, and cost to the American people. Historically, legislative authority and regulatory stringency have made several discrete leaps, each prompted by shocking revelations widely disseminated by the news media. To demonstrate their devotion to protecting the public health, legislators and regulators have augmented regulations, emphasizing the alleged benefits and disregarding the negative consequences for the industry and the patients it ultimately serves. In the past four years, the FDA has drastically slowed the rate at which it approves life-saving and life-extending medical devices. It has pursued an aggressive enforcement strategy that treats all regulated firms as suspected felons, restricting its communication and cooperation with them, and substantially increasing the number of punitive actions. In response, increasing numbers of firms have moved their operations abroad or begun planning to do so. The FDA's regulation of medical devices has produced little, if any, benefit, but imposed large and increasing costs. Those costs are, no, are not just economic, they also include deaths and human suffering. It is important to note that the FDA serves a valuable purpose in maintaining high safety and efficacy standards. However, it is also important to recognize that the FDA's actions directly affect the lives of patients and the ability of physicians to provide state-of-the-art care for their patients. That is why m many of my colleagues have joined with me to introduce H.R. 2290, which would provide positive changes to the present system without adversely affecting the FDA's high safety and efficacy, efficacy standards. In final, I share uh, Chairman McIntosh's concern regarding the IMDC's citizen petition, and, I'm equally, and, I, and I equally hope that today's hearing focuses on solutions and not just problems. I am confident that with the help of the many good people inside the FDA, we can develop effective and efficient ways to involve the public better in its development of guidance documents. I welcome today's witnesses, and I look forward to the testimony, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Chase, for your leadership and assistance. Thank you, Mr. Fox, and, and uh, my staff goes crazy when I say names sometimes. Uh, Mr. Chesmore, not Mr. Cheesmore, my apologies. <laughs> um, in spite of the uh, strong statements uh, made, uh, you are a very welcome guest, and um, we know your task uh, is not an easy one. Uh, we know there's uh, a lot uh, that you recognize can be improved in the agency, and uh, uh, in that spirit, uh, we look forward to your, your testimony. Um, Th Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. As you indicated, uh, I'm accompanied by uh, Dr. Bruce Burlington. Just turn the mic a little bit more so it's under your voice. Just tilt it a little. That, that's good, if that's all right. Thank you. Dr. Bruce Burlington, who's director of our Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Mr. Ronald Chesmore, uh, who's our associate director for regulatory affairs. And Ms. Ann Wine, who's our deputy chief counsel for program review. And I think that given the that Indiana is so well represented here, I should disclose that I am also from Indiana. I was born there and spent the early years of my life there. Uh, and nice and look know. back on it fondly, I should say. <laughs> and, and, it, and it has probably, it probably shaped uh, your life in very positive ways as well. I, I hope it did. <laughs> I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify about the relationship between regulations and informal guidance at the Food and Drug Administration. It's an issue that I've uh, been interested in for a number of years. And I think I should start by saying that on one level, the difference between a regulation and a guidance document is simple to explain. A regulation is binding as law. In fact, a regulation is law. A violation of a regulation is a violation of law. And because a regulation has such a significant status, the Administrative Procedure Act requires an agency such as the FDA to go through a very formal process of notice and comment rulemaking to issue a regulation. An example would be the label on, nutrition label on food that we see uh, so often. Uh, the agency specified exactly what must be on that label, what order and what format, and a violation of that regulation would be treated as a violation of law. A guidance document, on the other hand, sets out the agency's current thinking, but is not binding on the agency or on the regulated industry. Instead, it's used to inform our employees as to how we interpret the statute or regulations. It's used to promote consistency. Um, for example, guidance could be used to ensure that different medical reviewers, when they're reviewing similar products, apply consistent standards. Or it could be used to ensure that different inspectors 
inspecting different plants uh, do so in a consistent manner. Uh, secondly, guidance is used to inform in industry, uh, not as to what is legally required, but as to what the agency's thinking in is, so that the agency can get that advantage in complying with legal requirements. But as I say that, I say I want to underline that in contrast to a regulation, the industry is not required to comply with guidance. While those are the basic parameters, it is also true that the FDA <coughs> has not always been entirely consistent about how it uses guidance documents or what it calls them or how it issues them. And that's in part due to the fact they're issued by different centers. It's in part due to the fact that we're looking over a long period of time. And it's in part due to the fact that the legal requirements have changed over the years. In this context, the petition filed by the Indiana Medical Device Manufacturers Council has given us a vehicle to review the agency's policy with respect to guidance documents. And as we testify here we're in the middle of that review, we expect to complete it uh, by the end of October within the 180 days. Um, I don't know what the results will be, but what I'd like to do is spend the next few minutes just giving you an, an overview of what some of the key considerations are. And there are five points I want to make, and I'll make them very quickly. The first is what I've already said. Guidance documents are binding, on the, are not binding on the industry or on the FDA. And having said that, I would also say that we haven't always done an adequate job in communicating that fact uh, to our employees and, and to the industry. So that's a, an important consideration we have to look at. Secondly, guidance documents are extremely valuable both to the industry and the agency. Third, notice and comment, formal notice and comment rulemaking is neither practical nor feasible. It's not legally required. Uh, it's not consistent in some cases with the speed with which technology advances uh, with regard to some of the products we regulate and their resource considerations that we'd have to take into account. And the risk of requiring notice and comment rulemaking is that we'll end up with less guidance and thus less help to both our employees and the industry. Fourth, having said that, I would also say that public comment on guidance documents can be very useful and that most guidance documents would benefit from this kind of input. And again, although we've done this more in recent years, uh, we recognize that we haven't been totally consistent on this. Finally, I would say that we need to ensure we have an effective appeal mechanism so that if a company is unhappy about with a guidance document or thinks that it should not apply to its product, there ought to be an effective way within the agency then it could, that it can seek uh, review of that decision and not just a rubber stamp. Uh, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, uh, guidance documents are essential, we feel, both to the industry and the agency. However, we agree that improvements can be made in the procedures that the agency uses to develop, issue, and implement guidance documents uh, that are consistent with the public health. In developing a policy on this matter, we'll take into account both the extent that the uh, industry uh, and the agency need the documents and the extent to which uh, public participation uh, will be helpful. Mr. Chairman, the invitation letter indicated that the committee is uh, also interested in issues related to the uniformity of compliance with requirements applicable to devices. And if you wish, uh, Mr. Chesmore is, is prepared to speak for a few minutes uh, specifically on that topic. Would that be a request that he, that he testify? We would request it if you yeah, if Sure, you no, wish. happy to have him do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, throughout its history, FDA uh, has been concerned about uniformity in its uh, compliance activities, enforcement applications, and the application of the law. You, I'm sorry, yes, we're sir. just not picking up your voice as, as well. Uh, the the um, silver oh, mic is the one that bit. magnifies your voice. Is this better, sir? I think so. And if you could, you have a nice booming voice, that would help. <laughs> yes, sir. Over the years, we have developed a comprehensive approach to our activities based upon the establishment of national compliance programs, compliance policy guides, and standardized operating procedures. In addition to the examples that Mr. Schultz gave, I would like to uh, address two other issues that I believe go to the heart of what we believe helps us in our uniformity of operations in the field of FDA. 
These two examples are written guidance and training. In the area of written guidance, three areas. First, all field and center personnel use the same compliance program manual and compliance policy guidelines. These written documents, which we do share with the industry, clearly delineate what is to be inspected and analyzed, both foreign and domestic, why, how, and what regulatory or administrative action should or should not be appropriate based upon the inspectional and analytical findings. Second. All of the field investigators and their supervisors utilize the same investigations operations manual, the inspection guides, and import alerts. A third example of written guidance which we utilize to help achieve uniformity is a written regulatory procedures manual. Again, both headquarters and field personnel utilize this manual for guidance in such areas as the issuance of warning letters, the conduct of recalls, and the recommendation of formal agency compliance actions. These formal agency compliance actions, such as seizure, injunction, and prosecution, are also reviewed by appropriate headquarters staff as well as the Office of General Counsel to ensure uniformity. In the area of training, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that to be a consumer safety officer or an investigator in the Food and Drug Administration requires a minimum of 30 semester hours of science at college level. The majority of our, the vast majority of our investigators do have bachelor's or higher degrees. Once hired, investigators around the country participate in uniform basic classroom and on-the-job training. Examples include classes in basic food and drug law and investigative techniques. We also have a standard written training manual. We offer courses in basic device good manufacturing practices, and we also have advanced courses in such areas as auditing against the Mammography Quality Standards Act. We are also, Mr. Chairman, in the process of developing a formal investigator certification program, which we believe will also help to increase uniformity across the country. This particular program will include both formal training, on-the-job experience, and test are, will be required by our investigators. We believe that these particular activities go a great deal uh, in helping us assure uniformity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. You, any other comments? No. Okay. Um, then what we'll do is I'll open it up first to Mr. McIntosh, and then I'll go to Mr. Towns. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, I would, uh, before doing that, I would like to welcome um, Mr. Waxman. And Mr. Waxman, would you like to make an opening statement of any kind before you're, you're already in. Thank you. For, I appreciate that, but uh, you'll have time for questions just a second, too. Thank, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. McIntosh? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. L let me note that the notion that these policy statements are, are non-binding is in the context of an industry that must get approval from the agency in order to take any action in marketing its product or in fact in changing its product and the way it's manufactured so that while there there may be no legal indication that they are binding on either the agency or the manufacturer the absence of of compliance can effectively be used against them now whether or not the agency says it does that consciously, there's certainly a perception in the regulated community that that is what happens. And so to simply say they're non-binding, I think does not answer the question, especially in the context of life-threatening decisions that are being made. My question, first question would be, do any of the policies that are out there that have not been developed through notice and comment fit the definition of having general applicability and being having future effect? I think they do, yes. I mean, I think that some of them apply more than to a specific company, and uh, they certainly have future effect. But they're not binding in the sense that a company could not be prosecuted for violating one of those policies. A company has the opportunity, of course, to argue that it should not apply um, or that a different rule ought to apply to that company. Well, my understanding of the Administrative Procedures Act is that when you meet those two criteria, you have what is referred to as a rule. And Th that's that correct. But, but, but 
uh, that does not necessarily, and in a minute I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Wyan, who's our lawyer. Maybe I should ask her if she wants to add to this. But that does not necessarily mean the agency is required to go through notice and comment rulemaking. In other words, there are some rules that uh, require notice and comment rulemaking, and the courts have said basically it's those that are binding. And there are some rules that don't. So th let me make sure I'm following you. It's the agency's position that it meets the general definition of a rule but there's one of the exceptions that would allow them to not go through notice and comment for these policy guidelines. Well, I'm saying so, some of these policies could, could fall on that. Ms. Wan, do you want to add? We agree that the definition of rule in the Administrative Procedure Act is a very broad definition. In fact, some courts have said it could cover virtually any statement that an agency makes. So that it is important when we talk about when notice and comment rulemaking is required to go to, to Section 553 of the Act and, as you note, look at the exceptions to notice and comment rulemaking, which include interpretive rules and general statements of policy, the categories that cover generally the kinds of guidance documents that we're talking about today. Now, if, if you had a situation where something is a general statement of policy, and in order for somebody to submit an application for approval, the uh, 510K form, they have to follow those. Isn't that, in effect, a regulation? If, if they're being told you must consult this statement of policy before we're going to consider your application? Well, what we're saying is that the word must never goes along and should never go along with, with guidance, that it's not a must at all, but, but um, very often to get consistency among reviewers, for example, we will tell our reviewers uh, as you go through this type of application, here is what the agency's view is as to what, it need, what the company needs to do to meet the standard. Companies are understandably often very interested uh, in, in, in what our policies are as well, but it's, it's never, it's not a must because it's guidance. Le then my question is, what would ever justify developing these broad policies or interpretive documents in secret? Why not include the public in the procedures that are laid out under current law in a way that would allow that type of input into the agency? Well, in general, I think we can benefit from public participation. There certainly are cases where uh, speed uh, mandates that we have to do something quickly but even, even then, um, there's always an opportunity. I mean, once it's out there, the public always has the opportunity to come back to us or an industry or a company and say, you ought to do it this way or you ought to consider redoing it. And one of the advantages of guidance is it's much easier to change than a regulation. It can be changed much more quickly. But it's my understanding what's being asked for in this petition is that FDA change its process so that for these general guidelines that are future and in effect and of broad applicability, they will go back to the rule that they used to have of using notice and comment process in developing those. The, the petition seems to say that, but I think it misunderstands uh, where the agency uh, has been historically. If you, if you go back historically, you'll see over the last 20 years, there are many times the agency has used guidance on, and not, not through notice and comment rulemaking to uh, inform the public as to what its, its, its view of certain requirements were. Uh, what I see, though, also, in addition to what you said, as the thrust of this petition is saying to the agency, you ought to consider getting more public input on guidance documents because whatever you say, FDA, these guidance documents have real meaning and significance to the industry and the regulated industry ought to have the opportunity to participate. And I guess I would say to you that we see that as a very valid point. And as we uh, review this petition, we're going to seek ways of doing that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll have additional questions, but I'll yes. defer to others. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. But let, before I move forward, let me just sort of clear up something. I, it didn't sound too good, so I want to make certain that uh, uh, I know you're anxious and eager to uh, correct the problems, and I'm convinced of that. Uh, 
I think that some of these problems have gone on for many, many years. And, uh, of course, uh, when the chairman indicated that uh, you were not prepared to, to stay, that doesn't mean you're not going to leave somebody back here to hear what's being said. You're saying you're not prepared to, in, in, in to engage in a debate, but you are going to leave somebody here, and I hope, because let me just tell you why I say this. Because industry, industry feels that you're not listening. And I'd hate for you to do that because it would only confirm what industry is saying, that you are not listening, you don't intend to listen, and I don't think that. I think you want to listen. And the way this was said, and the way it was framed here, and the way you responded, you know, it appears to me that industry is right. And I don't think that's the case. We'll certainly have somebody here. We'll review the transcript. We're prepared to respond to any questions. We would be prepared to come back again. But um, we were asked, well, I don't want to go through it all, but something was just sort of thrown at us yesterday that was a, a very much a change in... In, in what we've been told before. But we're, as you say, uh, you know, we're certainly very interested in this hearing. I assume that some of what comes out of this hearing will be useful to us in responding to the petition. Right. At this point, I will yield to um, uh, uh, the uh, chairman of the uh, Health Subcommittee and also uh, uh, who also serves on this committee, uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, for any questions he might have at this time. Let him use my uh, five minutes at this time, and I'll wait it to turn around. Mr. Waxman, I yield to you. Well, I thank you for yielding to me. I do want my own time as well, but if you are yielding me the balance of your time, uh, I appreciate it. Um, you are listening to what we have to say at this hearing. I think it's important for Congress to hold hearings, get points of view, and try to be constructive. The key point, I believe, is to be constructive. But I, as I look at this issue, it seems to underscore the very difficult job that you have at the Food and Drug Administration. We want you to approve drugs and devices and oversee the safety of the food supply. We want all these things done right away, but we want them done right. And th therefore, if it takes uh, time for you to get all the information about, for example, as we're talking about today, a device, um, that means sometimes a delay in getting that device on the market, but it's a delay I think the public will understand if it means we're not going to get a device that's going to do harm to the public out before we know all the facts. As I understand what's going on is that rather than go through an extensive rulemaking, you're using guidance documents to give the information to the industry involved and also to tell other industries what FDA is going to expect from them in order to get a device approved. Is that, is that what this is basically about, Mr. Schultz? Yes, it could be approval or it could be guidance on when we do an inspection, this is what our inspector is going to look for. Now, the guidance documents, I, I presume, take a lot less time than if you went through a whole formal process of rules and regulations and federal register and notice and comment. Isn't that it, accurate? That's correct. So, in effect, you're being criticized for not taking the longer route of going through the formal procedures for establishing the rules and regulations and taking a shorter route. That, that's one level of criticism, but then I'm sure you're going to also be criticized for taking too long right. if you went the other way. So it really uh, is a dilemma. Now, if you do take a shorter route, then the question is how do you incorporate public participation and comment so that you can make the best guidance documents uh, that uh, would be applicable not only to the case before you, but for others to understand to move the process forward. That's correct. And I can tell you some of the things we do today. Uh, sometimes we'll put guidance documents out for public comment. Uh, sometimes we will have them discuss at advisory committee meetings. And sometimes we'll have uh, separate public meetings on them. And of course, every time uh, the public is entitled after the document is out, to come back and comment to us. And because it's guidance, it's very easy uh, for us to change the, the uh, guidance uh, if we think that's warranted by the comments. Mm -hmm. So you, you are aware then you want the input from, the, you say public comment, but really it's comment from the industry, uh, which uh, is important to have. It, it could, yeah, it could be the industry or anybody. Uh, it, uh, what I, we, do do this, we do this today. Uh, but what we don't do is do it necessarily consistently. And part of what we're looking at is looking across the agency 
to see what sort of cons policies we ought to adopt to ensure that it is con our policy is consistent. So you need public input. You need to make sure your guidance documents are consistent. You don't want to tell one industry one, one thing and the next day tell another industry another thing. Uh, you want some consistency and some uniformity in your policy so that people will know what the rules are. Right. And I guess the questions that uh, we're raising today in this hearing is how good a job are you doing and how can we uh, give you the tools if necessary, if you need it legislatively, to do a better job. Uh, uh, and I think it's in everybody's interest. I understand that we're going to hear other witnesses that are critical of the FDA, and that's appropriate to hear from them. And it's then it's appropriate to hear from you in response. But I think you ought not to be called in the same day. This is not a, uh, you ought to have a chance to evaluate what they have to say and give us your best judgment as to uh, the issues in debate and narrow the differences and learn from this rather than use this uh, hearing as a process simply to blame each other or whatever. That's certainly not constructive. I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Waxman. This issue has come up uh, uh, in other contexts as well. And what happens, what can happen is at a hearing, uh, certain allegations will be made against the agency that we sitting here have no information about. And what we need to do mm -hmm. is to go back, examine the record, and then we're happy to come back to the committee or to respond in writing uh, however the committee uh, uh, desires. Well, I think it's very important that the Congress act responsibly. And I've sat through many meetings when witnesses have come forward and said things that just weren't accurate uh, uh, without maybe even intending to say things that were untrue. I've heard anecdotes used by members of Congress to justify policies that didn't make any sense. And the anecdotes turned out to not have been accurate either. So I think we need to deal with this in a way that gives everybody a chance to be heard to evaluate what they have to say, and then think through uh, the best policies, not simply react quickly, because sometimes the quickest reactions or the most emotional reactions are not the most thoughtful. I thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, it's our hope that with Mr. Shea's voting first and me voting last, we'll be able to continue uninterrupted on this vote. Let me turn now to Mr. Souder. I wanted to comment just briefly on uh, Mr. Waxman's last point, it, it has been helpful in a number of hearings, however, to have the agency uh, late in the hearing as well, understanding that some comments may be made that you don't understand, but most of the people here today are pretty public in their objections you could have anticipated and probably have heard those objections many times. And for those of us who may not be as detailed in the field, it's helpful to get the exchange during the process of the hearings, but we'll certainly take you up on coming back again, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I have some questions related to the guidance um, as well. In the guidance documents, are those um, uh, usually followed through in the final uh, regulations? Uh, how often are they reversed later on? Well, um, very often um, there will be a guidance document that will be issued that is really much more detailed than would typically be appropriate in our practice in issuing regulations. And so they would not be followed up uh, through a regulation. They would simply be uh, available as guidance. And one of the things that we're looking at is whether we do a good job in, in, t in making them available so that somebody who's interested in guidance has a single place they could go to find out what the agency has said. So if you're a, a manufacturer uh, deciding what to put on the market and so I can try to understand the process, that a guidance document uh, in, um, while it's not a must, certainly at the very least is some sort of a potential threat of legal action if you don't follow it. In other words, potential threat of legal action if you don't follow it. In other words, if the guidance is, is that you shouldn't do this and you do it, while it might not be an enforcement, isn't there a possibility of future action against you? Or Yes, uh, just as there would be if there were no guidance document. But uh, if the manufacturer is in a vacuum, and it's trying to decide whether uh, it needs to come to the FDA or if it comes, what has to be in the application. If it has no information, it's at jeopardy. And if it has the guidance document and doesn't follow it, uh, it's at jeopardy. But at least if it had the guidance document, it has the opportunity to come to the agency and have the discussion. But isn't it true that certainly at greater risk of jeopardy if it knows the risk and still goes against it? In other words, I agree with you, there's risk 
being it, blind and there's also right. risk. Uh, but the more you know and then you go against it, uh, it becomes more likely that you're going to have a problem. Is that not the well, The only thing I would say is it's hard it's at some point to discuss this in the abstract and you, and you really need to have the specific example because there, there are times uh, when it's appropriate to deviate from gui guidance and uh, um, because of a special case or whatever and there'd be no legal jeopardy. And in, in saying that there's no legal jeopardy and it's not a must, would it, uh, does it not bias regulators? If you had a company that continually didn't follow the guidance documents or numerous times, wouldn't that kind of give you a warning maybe to keep your eye on that company? Would it be any kind of internal signal to regulators uh, to keep an eye on a company? It would really, it would really uh, depend. Uh, we also would have to talk about how we would even know if certainly if our inspectors go in to inspect and what they're really looking for is violations of the regulation or the statute and as it if you uh, we consistently see that then that is a red flag yes because uh, that comes back to the core question of input into those um, guidance documents because if in fact they're quasi official it puts a little more uh, I mean we'd ought Cer certainly you would grant that at the very least it's like a uh, strong warning sign and that it would be pretty risky to put a lot of capital into something if you had pretty strong signals that it wasn't. Uh, they're significant. We wouldn't go through the trouble if they didn't have some significance. And so I agree with you. It is important in terms of fairness to the regulated industry and just to get the document be the best it can be to get input from the public. Do you, um, in the... Hudson uh, study and in, in documents before the release of this uh, current uh, study today, um, they've made uh, charges and I think it's pretty logical to assume that uh, lives are lost by not approving certain devices as well. Do you disagree with that premise uh, that lives are lost by delaying certain devices from coming to market? I do disagree with the, the basic theme of that study. and. Uh, Dr. Burlington, who runs the device center, uh, is, is really the one I'd, I'd like to have respond to, to it if you want to go into it more than that. I, I would like to because uh, if something is not of direct uh, clear threat to somebody's uh, life and yet having that device could potentially save their life, why would it not be true that delaying access to that device would, could be costing lives in America? Having trouble following all the negatives with due respect. Uh, in in, in other words, question. if you have... But I think I get the point. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Burlington, can, and I, I apologize that you've got a question that you now can't respond to, but, but can I we also ask to you vote. to hold that? We have to go vote. Oh, here's Mr. Shays. I'll let him continue. I'll, I'll come back or I'm going to miss a vote. Do you want me to hold my answer then? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My basic question centers around the whole concern I have that the FDA, in order to uh, deal with its environment as it sees it, ends up writing its own rules of conduct for itself. Um, we see that in terms of the whole issue of, of time requirements, where th the time requirements, candidly, by law, aren't realistic. So the FDA has amended them. And as a result, it chooses its own times. And so some cases, it may take 10 years for a, a product to be approved. Uh, in some cases, it could be the, uh, the manufacturer who thinks that it or disapproved, it thinks that it's not going to like the answer, so it's not going to push the answer quickly. And so, I mean, there are a lot of factors. But the bottom line to this informal process, it seems to me, is that it enables you to um, uh, not have to have public comment and not have it have the impact that it should have. And uh, um, so maybe you could just kind of address that issue. Um, the The... The point about deadlines, I think, is a valid one uh, on both sides, the 
the, the ones in the statute, I think everybody recognizes that some of them anyway aren't realistic, and therefore then we have no deadlines. We had, I think, a very good experience in the drug area that maybe we can build on in other areas. Uh, in 1992, in conjunction with the industry and Congress, the FDA had six months or so of discussions with the drug industry to come to agreement about what would be realistic in terms of resources and what would be realistic in terms of approval times for new drugs. We ended up with very ambitious times, six months for important drugs uh, for review, for making a decision, and a year for all drugs for making a decision. Uh, and we were given five years to get to that goal. And I can say that we are very much on track. We've met all the interim goals. And so I think it's... I think it's, um, I think you've identified a real problem. I, I, I think that there, there may be ways of, of coming to a solution, but what we learned from that um, experience is it's very important to have all three parties involved, Congress, the industry, and the agency employees, because if goals are set that aren't realistic and that the agency hasn't said it can, it can meet and the employees aren't committed to, um, then, then none of us are getting what we want. But let, let's just focus on, on interpretive rules. Um, right now, that is an informal process. Is that correct? Yes. I think it's and the formal process requires you to do what? Um, it requires us to uh, put out a proposed rule, publish it in the Federal Register for notice and comment, receive the comments, and then in the final rule um, actually respond to every comment and explain, every substantive comment, explain uh, what we did to accept it or why we rejected it. And then that would be subject to judicial review. Major rules go through a review, not just at the agency, um, all the way through the agency, but through the department and the Office of Management and Budget. Now, and, and explain once again, I know you've done it before, in, in fairly simple terms, why that process isn't acceptable for you. Well, why you have to use the interpretive uh, process. It, it's acceptable when the regulation is going to be binding and we use it uh, uh, constantly. I mean, the Federal Register is full of regulations the agency has issued. Um, but we don't think it is realistic to use that for all the guidances that we've issued. If we have, um, we have probably one to 2,000 pages of regulations in the Code of Federal Regulations. We have, I think now, uh, close to 1,000 guidances that have been issued over the years. Just so I understand, uh, I, I understand and I think I appreciate that you don't think it's realistic. Given that you don't think it's realistic, you by what authority have this pr have developed this process? Well, the Administrative Procedure Act, as interpreted by the courts, has sa says that uh, if the regulation or whatever is not binding, then we don't need to go through that formal process, and we don't really need to go through any process. And what what I'm suggesting here is that. Uh, particularly in recent years, we, we go through an in-between process where we do generally accept public comment. Somebody just gave me a note that in the device area, uh, we've, uh, we've sent 49 of these guidances to advisory panels in the last two years, where we have public advisory panels that we get advice from on the guidance. So what I'm suggesting is there's an in-between where we can get the public input, um, but not go through uh, the full rulemaking process. Now, I should say, in some cases, for both regulations and guidances, you have a matter that is so important that in the public interest you need to get it out um, be, uh, uh, and get the public input later. Uh, and we always want to, you know, reserve for that. But in general, um, we do accept the point of the Indiana petition that the public ought to be able to comment on these. So based on the court's uh, interpretation of your rulemaking authority, 
since it's not binding, they say that you can follow this process. In, this, in, in following this process, though, what you have effectively done is, is cut out the opportunity for petitioners to have a formal process whereby they can make comment. What is the solution to that? What I'm suggesting is there, there are two parts. One is I think we should have a consistent policy across the agency uh, of A, making it clear these aren't binding, B, in general, allowing public comment, and C, providing for an appeals process so if somebody isn't happy with the guidance, they have somewhere else at the agency they can go to appeal it. Um, with, without giving it the kind of thought I'd like, those all three sound sensible. How have you uh, started to implement that? Well, we, um, we haven't started to implement it, but we are basically using the uh, deadline for the petition as a deadline, internal deadline for ourselves, and so would expect to have something thought out that we could make public uh, uh, by the time the response to the petition is due, which is the very end of October. Okay. And that, that's, our, that's our goal, and I what expect to at least come close to meeting that. This committee is going to spend, uh, give a, a great deal of attention to the whole uh, practice of the FDA and basically, in our judgment, uh, uh, inventing its own rules and then um, uh, using them in what I sometimes think is an arbitrary way or certainly not a consistent way. And I, I like bureaucracies to have some flexibility, so I have to think that through. But but um, it allows you to pick and choose in ways that I don't think are always fair. Um, and uh, so we're very interested in, in, in following up on this, obviously. Mr. Fox, are you prepared to yes, ask sir. some questions? I'm going to also give you this for a second as well, because I'll be gone for a second. So you're in charge, buddy. Okay. I'll call it myself. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Never had this much power before or since. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Schultz, uh, thank you for uh, you and your staff, uh, your colleagues, for attending today this important hearing. Uh, I just had a few questions, if, you, if I could, and to the extent you want to answer them. Otherwise, I'd defer to uh, the other experts. I'd appreciate it. In the administration's reinventing government proposal, 125 categories of Class I medical devices are nominated for exemption from the pre-market notification process. Have those categories of dev devices been identified? Do you know? I believe the answer is yes. Dr. Burlington, do you want to? Add to that, I believe we issued a notice, didn't we? For the Go exemption. ahead. Yes. For the exemption. Yes, we've issued a notice in the Federal Register. Uh, what administrative procedures were used to identify these categories, if you know? Rulemaking. Okay. Notice and comment rulemaking. And has the regulated community been afforded an opportunity to comment? Yes. Okay. The FDA has proposed that device manufacturers establish quality assurance systems that identify who is responsible for various aspects of the design and manufacturing process. Does the FDA have any such system to monitor its own business? And if so, who bless you. And if so, who is responsible for seeing that the 510K applications are processed within 90 days and that PMAs are processed within 180 days as mandated by the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act? I'd like to ask Dr. Burlington to to um, respond to that since he uh, is the director of the Center a, for Devices. That was a difficult question. I would have I would have delegated that one myself. <laughs> Dr. Burling. I was going to say to take a crack <laughs> at it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Fox. Uh, that responsibility is delegated to the center and to the Office of Device Evaluation within the center. Uh, we seek good management principles in order to get decision making at the lowest level that is uh, feasible with a reasonable level of control of the quality of the decisions and we seek quality control mechanisms so that we know what's going on, that we can do a better job in matching resources with work flow in order to get towards, uh, get to those uh, uh, statutory directives and time frames. We have in the past, in fact, fallen short of that, as you are aware. We have made, however, significant progress over the last couple of years towards reapproaching those goals, particularly in the case of 510Ks and PMA supplements. We're beginning to make progress as well on PMAs, and this year have made significant progress on investigational device exemptions in terms of getting them cleared on the first cycle. We have been fairly consistent in meeting our goal of getting those uh, acted upon within the 30-day statutory directive. Uh, we see consistency. We monitor what's going on. We meet among the delegated officials who have the responsibility to review decisions uh, with exactly the sort of quality control that was anticipated in your question, I believe. Uh, H.R. 2290, which is my bill to try to speed up the device 
approval process. I hope that someone from FDA might, I don't know whether it's Mr. Schultz, could tell us uh, who might be looking to that bill as far as the agency's involvement in recommendations of changes or uh, what their feelings are. Well, we will look at it, um, and it, uh, my office will look at it, the, the center, Dr. Burlington Center will look Good. at it, our Office of Legislative Affairs will look at it, and we'll be happy to discuss it uh, with you or your staff. Uh, let me ask a question regarding uh, the Administrative Conference of the United States. Uh, they had a letter on September 24, 1990. Uh, I guess it was from uh, Marshall Breger, uh, chairman of the uh, Administrative Conference, uh, to James Benson, the then acting commissioner of, of the Food and Drug Administration in Rockville, Maryland. And in that letter, uh, the thrust of the comments and of the conference recommendation, interpretive rules of general applicability and statements of general policy is that FDA should reconsider its seeming all or nothing approach with regard to using notice and comment procedure. And in the last part of the letter, he says, for these reasons, uh, I urge you to seriously consider adopting the procedures set forth in conference recommendations 76-5 in your amended rule. Uh, why then did the FDA abandon its policy of putting uh, interpretive rules through notice and comment rulemaking over the objections of the administrative conference letter? I haven't seen that letter, uh, but I can tell you why we made that change in our regulations. And I'd like to see the letter. It may be that, give you a copy. that what we're talking about here and what we have been doing since 1990, to a large extent, but maybe not enough, of allowing, uh, providing an opportunity for, to, for uh, public comment in many cases on guidelines is consistent with what that letter was saying. But the, um, as I said before, before and after 1990, the agency consistently used uh, guidelines uh, as a way of informing industry of what it was doing without going through the time-consuming uh, notice and comment process. Uh, the reason we made the change in 1990 is the case law changed in such a way that some courts suggested that they might be construing our regulation as requiring us to go through the full notice and comment process in situations where we had never intended that to be the case and had never in the past done it. But I, I'd like to see the letter and, and uh, we could respond to you either here or, or, or at another time. We're going to give you a copy of the letter, Mr. Okay. Schultz. Uh, let me say, in following up, if I may, and I appreciate the Chairman McIntosh's indulgence for me to ask a few more questions. Um, in, in following up on your comment, on the notice and comment procedure, wouldn't that give industry uh, that's at the front lines a better chance to give you input uh, by maintaining that procedure? It, it would certainly give them uh, a chance to give us input. What we're saying, I think, is in most cases, we can afford the opportunity for input either through advisory committees that are public um, or other kinds of comment without incurring the delay and disadvantages of a full-blown rulemaking process. And since we don't intend for these guidances to be binding, it really doesn't seem to be necessary or a good use of our resources to go full through the full-blown process. Let me ask you this. Within the Office of Device Evaluation, who decides when a guidance is final and signs off on it? I'll, I'll let Dr. Burlington ask, answer that since it's about his center. Um, procedural uh, guidances used in that office uh, that affect the office and are cross-cutting are decided by the office director or one of her deputies. Uh, vertical guidances, guidances that are product specific or product area specific, I should say, uh, tend to be uh, done at the division level. Okay. And uh, finally, within the Office of Device Evaluation, which members of the public uh, get to see the draft guidance and who decides that? The individuals who are responsible for signing off on guidances are the ones who make decisions about at what stage the public input will be received. We inevitably seek public input. We have, in fact, invited the members of industry and the public at large to submit their proposals for guidance to us and that we would use those as starting documents. As uh, Mr. Schultz mentioned, we have 49 times in the last two years discussed with advisory committees uh, guidances and evolution. And we take seriously comments received after guidances are initially put forward in draft. 
so that we have a uniform policy of seeking that input. Uh, this time at which it is done in, in the development of a guidance uh, is at the discretion of the person who has the responsibility for issuing it. The only thing, last thing I would make a comment on is that I hope that the FDA will work closely with Congress and, the, and all other interested parties because I think when it comes to medical devices, we are trying to make sure we get them to market faster without sacrificing quality and, and, and uh, efficacy of standards. Uh, I absolutely agree with you, Mr. Fox. The, the members of the Center, uh, just as the members of this committee, clearly want us to be both fast and decisive as well as consistent and also open with a high level of procedural input in terms of the promulgation of guidances and in, and in getting these guidances so that they make sense for industry. But we also recognize there is tension among that need for speediness, consistency yes. and openness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Um, let me turn, Mr. Schultz, to one of the examples you used in your te written testimony, the 510K modification guidance, and I think it is entitled uh, Deciding When to Submit a 510K for a Change to an Existing Device. And that if it is in fact the case that these are meant to be a heads up to industry but not enforceable and not creating any legally enforceable rights or responsibilities, then how do you or how does the agency explain what happened to Star Dental in their dentalese modification, which was documented in the medical device approval letter dated August 1995, and I will submit the uh, newsletter to the record, in which they were told by the inspectors who were slapping them on the hands at least for making a modification in their product that they should review and that document in deciding whether to make those type of modifications. And that to me sounds as if it has pretty significant legal consequences if there might be an enforcement action taken against someone. I'm at a disadvantage because I, I haven't seen, I don't think, the document that you have there. The newsletter. Um, I can but what I would say is that companies, the reason companies want guidance is because they want to be able to review them in conjunction with making decisions. Uh, that is different from saying that the guidance could be the basis for any kind of prosecution, which it could not be. The guidance would, could not be uh, the basis for a prosecution. Uh, it is not binding. And, and I think that is the fundamental problem we have here is that FDA's regulatory process is structured so that and regulated entity can't make a move without approval. And so the problem is the guidance become effectively legally binding for people in order to take an action. And what was told to this company was, look, before you do this in the future, read this guidance and make sure you have followed it in deciding whether or not to come in and seek a formal modification uh, under the 510K proceeding. But I think if they had read the guidance, they would see that the guidance it's not. It's guidance. It's not binding, and uh, if they don't want to follow it, and they have a, they can come. I, I and think you're not understanding what I said. Okay. Explaining happened. They didn't read the guidance. They were slapped on the hands and told they should have read the guidance. But I, now presumably they weren't reading it just to see. They don't have to read it. I mean, somebody wanted them to read it for the substantive requirements and follow those when they made their decisions. I don't know the facts of this. I mean, it. it you know. It, it, it could well be, and I'm just speculating, that the inspector said, "Well, look, you're doing it wrong. Uh, uh, have you seen this guidance? You ought to, you ought to look at it," and walked away without any sort of penalty or consequence. Or it could be the inspector made a mistake. I, I, I just don't know the facts. Okay. Well, look, if you could go back and, and find out for us on that. But let me ask: Are there written instructions to the field inspectors or or guidance internally on? when to refer to guidance when you are dealing with the regulated community? I would like to ask Mr. Chesmore to answer that since that is his, his area. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are written uh, guidelines and, and instructions on this guidance. And the guidelines clearly state that uh, with respect to uh, the list of observations, the 483 that perhaps you have heard about, uh, in, investigators are not supposed to cite a firm when they do not uh, uh, follow guidance documents. We encourage the investigator to mention this to the firm during a closeout session, but it's not supposed to be. 
uh, on the 483. And as such, uh, we, we mentioned a little while ago, or you, someone brought up, I think that uh, encouraging industry uh, at the time of these investigations and these inspections to, to make their objections known to the investigator, to challenge the investigator. If they disagree, certainly we, we are encouraging them uh, to come in and talk to the local district management about how they interpret uh, these guidance documents. And so while this is standard in our training uh, and investigators are given guidance with respect to how to utilize these things, uh, from time to time perhaps someone will stray away from what we ask them to do. And, and Again, I, have, I don't know the specifics on this particular firm either, sir. And, and uh, I just saw it in the newsletter. The, I have to say, though, this, this has a Alice in Wonderland type quality to this whole discussion because what we're saying is in, in order to avoid the necessity of getting public input before we develop guidance that we don't publish anywhere for people to refer to in making decisions we've developed this elaborate procedure internally at the FDA to tell people that they can't talk about this guidance but nonetheless it's there it's sitting at the agency and it's something that they're using in making decisions day to day wouldn't it be a lot easier just to say we're going to go through the steps, get public input. We're going to have a list that's published in the Federal Register of these guidance documents. And we're going to follow these procedures and not have to con create an elaborate construct to discipline ourselves internally to not use them. I, I agree with you that, as a general matter, we should get public input. And I agree that they ought to be published in some place where they're easily accessible. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean formal rulemaking. And it, I don't think it necessarily means in the Federal Register. I mean, we, we're open to thoughts on this. We've thought about, you know, maybe it should be put on the FDA page on the Internet. There may be actually ways where we can get it out faster and more efficiently than the Federal Register. But I, I don't think we disagree with your basic points. Well, and, and I welcome the fact that you want to use the petition as, a, as an opportunity to develop that. And I do recommend you can consult with people over at ACUS. They, they've thought a lot about the notice and comment requirements in this and other regulatory areas. They're not partisan particularly, and, and they would be helpful in, in doing that. Um, also see Sally Katzen over at OIRA. I mean, she's thought a lot about these issues herself and, and is very, very good on that. Let me turn to another question, and then I've, I've got to go vote. Um, what, what is the agency's response to, to really the fundamental question raised by the Hudson study that in the United States, with the changes in the device approval process in the last four or five years, we are behind Europe and in the consequence of that is that it's less safe, less healthy, in fact costing us lives of people who could benefit from these devices if the approval process moved quicker? And I, Dr. Burlington is, is prepared to respond to the specifics uh, of that petition. I think in general, though, we are charged, appropriately so, with protecting the public health by ensuring that devices have a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness before they're approved. We're also charged with doing that in a timely manner. And we recognize that particularly if it's a breakthrough device, uh, we need to do, we need to do that as quickly as 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 we can. We need to make these decisions uh, uh, in an expeditious manner. Uh, Dr. Burlington has been director of the Center for Devices for about two and a half years, and I think if you look at the performance during that period of time, he has made very significant strides in achieving those those goals. Uh, he can talk to you. General about what I just talked to, but also about the specifics of that article. I think many of which, uh, uh, many of which are misleading. Let let me call a recess now, and I would like to hear that when we get back. Okay. And and I'll tell you one other question, so you can think about which direction you want to go in it. Should there be a formal process or or some way in which the agency consciously considers the downside effect of taking an extra step in the approval process? Maybe after the effect, they say you know, during the seven years or five years or four years, whatever it was, there were these many people who could have benefited by this and didn't. And, but we think it's reasonable because we had to ensure safety and efficacy. Right now, that fact is never put into the equation, at least in a public fashion. 
and, and think about whether there's something beneficial there. The committee will stand in recess until either Mr. Shays or I return. Thank you. If everyone could please take their seats. I appreciate uh, the FDA folks for waiting as we went through both of those votes. I understand that my question has been asked a couple times and you haven't had a chance to answer it. So uh, before we dismiss you, and I have no other questions, or if I do, I'll put them in writing. Mr. Green, has one. Uh, Mr. Green I understand, has one. But yeah. Mr. Burlington, would you proceed with the agency's response on this? And, and then we'll see what Mr. Green's question is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to address the question that you and, and Mr. Sutter have raised uh, regarding the uh, Hudson Institute report. Uh, without going into full detail, and, and we'd be glad to provide full detail for the record if you wish, um, I, I'd like to say in general that there, there is a thesis here that when a product is safe and effective, that it was probably also safe and effective the day before and stretching some time before that. And any time lost denies those benefits to the individuals during that time that was lost. And, to, and, and we certainly see the sense of that argument and agree with it, in fact, but have to understand that the safety and efficacy of a product, whether it's a pharmaceutical or whether it's a medical device, is not just in the article itself. It's also in understanding how to use it properly so that one can select which patients it's going to benefit and which ones it won't. And that that is one of the things that is learned during the development process and, in fact, refined during the review process that takes place at the agency. In addition, you can't look at only the successes. One also needs to consider those products which offer great hope initially but turn out to falter in the development process and not bear through uh, that promise. And when you take these things together, we think that there is a benefit to having regulatory review, to the independence, to the uh, winnowing of the hopes and the looking and saying where is there objective evidence that practitioners can use to guide medical decision making. Incumbent on us also is that when we have something where we've got the evidence in front of us that it's going to make a difference in health care, that we move speedily to get that to market so that the public will then get that benefit. Uh, I've taken this seriously throughout my career at FDA. Certainly I took it seriously in the Center for Drugs when I was there, uh, both uh, directly approving products and, and working with the division uh, of anti-infective drug products to speed up uh, our review times. I've certainly taken it seriously in the Center for Devices these last two and a half years. After I had been there just a couple of months and realized one of the uh, categories of products that was uh, discussed in, in uh, Mr. Murray's, uh, or Dr. Murray's uh, paper, uh, the uh, endocardial, uh, or endovascular leads for uh, automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillators uh, were in the agency and uh, I, looking at the data and saying that these have evidence that they make a difference in patient outcomes, I said we have got to put in place a policy where we take those things out of queue, where we deal with these things as expediently as possible. When you know something makes difference, then you can no longer afford to wait and hold it in line. We, uh, and, and we did that and are proceeding to continue to do that with important products that have a medical benefit. Uh, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that we shouldn't make that decision lightly. We shouldn't make it on unsupported hopes of a manufacturer because each manufacturer has that hopes and we have an obligation to manufacturers for fairness and consistency in how we handle their applications and so that we're not taking them out of line or out of their turn in the review queue until we have that evidence that they make a medical difference. But then when we do, uh, Dr. Alpert and I, Dr. Alpert, Director of Device Evaluation and I, are committed to putting in place processes to get those things reviewed and approved expediently. Uh, how many devices pose serious health risks for, uh, on the magnitude of causing someone to die if they're treated with them? Uh, I don't have a count of devices that pose her serious health risks. In general, when you are using a device as an intervention in a life-threatening illness, you can almost count on it having a health risk attendant to it. 
For instance, uh, some of the products that are discussed in Mr. Murray's paper, the, uh, uh, one of the cardiac valves, I mean, cardiac valves are certainly a category of products where there are complications that are life-threatening. Uh, placing uh, intra-arterial stents in people with threatened heart attacks, uh, when you put a metal cage inside of an artery supplying blood to the heart, if something goes wrong, the chance the patient may die is very real and palpable. Uh, so that the, the higher the benefit of the products, often the higher the risk as well. well uh, this will be a debate that I'm sure will continue over time. Um, let me ask Mr. Green, you indicated you had one question for the FDA panel. I have one question. Again, I've, like a lot of members, I apologize for not being here earlier, but I was looking forward to the hearing and some of the issues that have come up. And one of the things that caught my attention, and again, not knowing some of the other questions that were asked, if you, if you had a chance to answer them before members ran the vote, was that the Indiana Medical Device Group Citizens Petition, they cite a number of cases where the FDA had developed rules without public participation and then announced the rules through speeches, press releases, and things like that and the cite the example of using the reference list to determine whether the agency would clear a 510k submission. The Indiana Medical Device Group alleged that this policy was developed without public participation. It was announced in July of 1992 in a speech by Ronald Johnson, then director of the Office of Compliance at the FDA Center for Device, Devices and Radiological Health. I'd ask for your comment, but I would hope we would have a better structure than announcing policy at a speech simply because um, you know, I would hope that the Federal Register would be more apropos to do that and instead of using speeches or press releases, and I can see where you'd use those to publicize, but the actual information should be available to everyone and, and there should be some other better way to do it. And if you could just comment on if that happened from Mr. Johnson and there wasn't any other public notice on that. Uh, let me comment first on the general point and then talk about the specifics of the reference list, if that's okay. useful. Uh, on, the, on the general point, um, what, what we have said is, as we look at the petition and look at our process and our use of guidances versus regulations, while we don't agree with the exact re uh, request for relief in the petition, we do agree with the basic, basic thrust of it, which is to say uh, we ought to look at getting public input more consistently to guidances and figuring out a way to publish them and make them available uh, to people. I don't know that that's necessarily through the Federal Register, but there, there ought to be uh, one place companies can go to find out what the guidance is. And we are, uh, in the context of responding to the petition, doing a review of all these issues and, and we'll have a response uh, relatively shortly, we hope. In terms of the reference list, um, uh, let me tell you what the problem was, what we did, and then how we changed it, because we don't think we did it quite right the first time. Um, the problem was that we had uh, 510K applications where a company comes in to us and says, I want to sell a medical device because it is substantially equivalent to a device already on the market. And my job is just to convince you that it is basically the same as something already on the market. So you had that going on in the Center for Devices, while at the same time you had our inspectors going into the plant and in some cases finding very serious good manufacturing practice violations which raised questions about whether the company was capable of consistently making the same product, thus raising questions about whether it would in fact be substantially equivalent. For some period of time, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing and the theory of the reference list was we ought to get the information that the inspector found to the people reviewing the devices so they could take that into account in reviewing the application. And, and that's what, uh, what uh, Ron Johnson, what Mr. Johnson uh, announced in that speech. Now, the policy was, was uh, very much criticized by the industry as being secret. They didn't know. Uh, they said they didn't know whether they were on the list, they didn't know how to get off, and so on. And so as part of the President's Reinventing Government initiative uh, last spring, we made some very clear statements, and I think they have been very satisfactory to the regulated industry. First of all, we said we will only hold up the application if there's a connection between what we found at the plant and the ability uh, to make the product. Um, secondly, we said 
if, if you're in that category, we'll tell you right away. We won't wait until we're ready to approve the application and tell you. We'll tell you right away. And third, we said, if you tell us you fix the problem, we will get back within 60 days and reinspect. And if we don't meet that deadline, then we won't hold up your application because we weren't able to get back to reinspect. And as I said, I think that's been uh, satisfactory. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Green. Thank you, thank you Mr. Thank you, Mr. Slaughter. Uh, let me ask unanimous consent that we hold the record open for three days if there are any other written questions for, for this or the subsequent panel. And I appreciate the agency officials for joining us today and look forward to seeing the resolution on the petition on this matter. Uh, Th thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. McIntosh, we will have somebody here in case there are any other questions you want responses on the record to. I appreciate that. Let me mention one thing, Mr. Schultz. I think may have, people may have misinterpreted one of your characterizations of the petition, but I think we're in agreement on that it's, it doesn't apply to all policy statements or guidelines, but it, it's narrowly drafted to request those a future effect and general applicability. And interpretive that, rules. That, that, that's right, that aren't um, product specific. I, th I think that was my reading of their request. I think that's right. We should go back and look at it. On that. Th thank you all for coming and, and appreciate you staying through the rest of the hearing. At this point, if, if there's uh, no objection, I think I would like to combine the thir second and third panels and ask all of those witnesses to come forward at the same time. Make sure everyone's in front of their own name tags or I'll be calling you by the wrong names. Um, if, if I could ask each of the members of this combined panel to please rise and, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Let the record show that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Our first witness on this panel is uh, Mr. Bradley Thompson, who is an attorney with Baker and Daniels and counsel to the Indiana Medical Device Manufacturers Council. I appreciate you coming by today and uh, joining us for this hearing. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, just go ahead and share with us. I would ask each of you to summarize your testimony for us verbally and submit the complete remarks in, for the record. Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will summarize, and in fact, uh, what I'd like to do is respond rather than proceed along the lines of my written testimony, which I have submitted. Um, I'd like to respond directly to um, what the FDA has, uh, has said this afternoon. Um, I'd like to start out by acknowledging um, the, the, uh, uh, what I heard to be positive remarks that FDA made uh, about their intentions to uh, critically examine this area and to make changes, uh, the changes that are appropriate. Um, I find that very encouraging, and uh, I was very pleased to hear that. Um, what I'd like to do is, at the very outset, because there's some um, confusion about what the Indiana petition requests, spend just 30 seconds and explain that um, at the beginning. We, we request essentially three things. Number one, we request that the FDA's administrative regulations be amended so that uh, interpretive rules and rules of agency practice and procedure will undergo notice and comment rulemaking just as substantive rules do. What we did is we took the exact same language that was deleted in 1991 and proposed adding it back. So what FDA did from 1977 to 1991 would again be the law. Um, for other documents, and I'll call them guidance documents, uh, that includes a whole variety of things, speeches, warning letters, um, uh, points to consider documents, any number of things which communicate a regulatory expectation. We would ask and a, and a different procedure be adopted, not formal notice and uh, comment rulemaking, but what we call good guidance practices to be adopted. 
We borrow that name from good manufacturing practices, which, as you know, are the FDA's requirements for quality manufacturing. Good guidance practices, in our view, would simply be um, a set of standards that FDA would use to judge whether it is turning out quality guidance. The third um, change that we would ask is simply one of monitoring, that FDA uh, do a more systematic job of making sure that it's complying with those two prior changes, that they're complying with the good guidance practices and that they're complying with the, the rulemaking requirements, which means rather than rely on training an individual reviewer to understand um, and hopefully not announce new policy without going through those procedures, that some central office at FDA um, essentially, to, to the extent they can, uh, review these materials to make sure that the system is in fact functioning the way it should. That's what we're requesting. It isn't terribly different from the situation that existed before 1991, except that we would ask that for these guidance documents, which do uh, uh, include a tremendous volume of documents, that the FDA take a more systematic approach to how it ensures public participation. Um, there's a real lack of procedures at FDA to ensure that the public is involved when these guidance documents are developed. Now, having said that, I would like to respond to the five guiding principles um, uh, that the FDA announced as guiding their review. I find them, by and large, encouraging, but I also have some comments on them. Um, the first one is that guidance documents cannot be binding. Um, that's obviously true. That's, in fact, the law. Um, we would point out, however, that the disclaimer approach is not a viable way of ensuring that guidance documents are not binding. What I mean by the disclaimer approach is you go through, if you're the FDA, um, 10 pages of very detailed requirements, and then at the end you say, and by the way, this is an internal document. That disclaimer at the bottom of page 10 doesn't change the fundamental nature of that document. It is the way the FDA behaves in using that document which controls whether or not it is binding. So we would ask FDA to acknowledge that and do more than add disclaimers, but make sure that the documents are not used in that fashion, number one. And number two, as I said, use good guidance practices in developing those documents to ensure that they have the appropriate amount of quality. The second guiding principle is that guidance is good. We would agree. The only caveat I would suggest is that we say quality guidance is good. Guidance lacking quality does no good. It wastes resources and it causes confusion. The systems we're talking about today are designed to ensure that the, that the documents have quality. Now, one of those systems is to ensure that um, uh, uh, there's public participation. One of the main criticisms of the documents has been that they lack clarity. They're written without necessarily understanding the situations to which they're to be applied, or maybe they're just written inartfully. But when you solicit comments, you learn that, and you can change it. Um, Mr. Chairman, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the Price Waterhouse survey, and I think that survey speaks to this point quite well. The objective of the survey was to find out what industry thinks is the cause of significant delays in products, product approval. As you mentioned, 75 percent the, of the respondents <coughs> excuse me, in the device industry found that the guidance documents were so unclear that they were either not helpful or actually harmful. Considering the amount of time and effort that FDA puts into the guidance documents, FDA isn't getting a very big bang for its buck. The third um, uh, principle that is a guiding principle at FDA is that they, will, um, uh, they, they believe that notice and comment should not be followed for guidance documents. Based on what I've said before, you can already tell my response to that. We don't either. We think that notice and comment is important for interpretive rules, Interpretive rules, frankly, aren't that voluminous. All you have to do is look at how much rulemaking activity was going on before 1991, and you realize that, that it's not that many. But if a guidance document inappropriately includes an interpretive rule, then that interpretive rule should be subject to notice and comment. I would hope that very few, if any, guidance documents would include interpretive rules. That would be, under our scenario, inappropriate. But the guidance documents could still and, and would still be welcomed. The fourth guiding principle um, is that um, uh, most guidance documents would benefit from comment. The only suggestion I would have is that he revise it and say all guidance documents. Guidance documents by their nature um, are indications to the public as to what they're supposed to do. If nothing else, clarity is important. 
Um, the fifth one, that the appeal process be used. Um, we approach that with mixed feelings. Obviously, an appeal process is no substitute for quality guidance in the first place. And I have yet to see an effective appeal process that can adequately insulate against uh, possible retribution. Those are my uh, suggestions as to um, uh, ways perhaps to uh, uh, rethink some of the guiding, uh, guiding principles that FDA will be operating under. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to respond to questions or an hour right. later. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. What I think we'll do is hear from each of the witnesses and then open it up for questions. Our next witness will be uh, Mr. Larry Pilot, who is an attorney with Kenna and Cuneo, McKenna and Cuneo and counsel to the Medical Device Manufacturers Association. Welcome, Mr. Pilot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> On behalf of the Medical Device Manufacturers Association, which I'll refer to as MEDMA, I thank you for the opportunity to verbally summarize our interests in FDA's enforcement standards for medical devices, and in particular, the uh, citizen's petition filed by the Indiana Medical Device Manufacturers Council. I have provided a prepared statement which, which I request be made part of the record of this hearing. I believe every manufacturer of a device intends to comply with laws administered and enforced by FDA. Explicit provisions of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act make it quite clear what the expectations are for compliance and what the penalties are for violations of the Act. The historical performance of the device industry which is dominated by small and very creative manufacturers, supports a reputation of compliance. Very few disputes about compliance result in litigation. However, there have been an increasing number of FDA enforcement activities during the last several years which would create for the public the false impression that the device industry is riddled with violators. I believe many of the FDA enforcement initiatives are not supportable in law and are the product of misunderstanding on the part of both industry and the FDA. Often, in my opinion, this is due to a shoot first, ask questions later attitude by the FDA. The Indiana Citizens Petition seeks to reduce the possibility of misunderstanding by emphasizing the importance of rulemaking to make clearly specific what is required for compliance. MEDMA supports this initiative. Additionally, MEDMA, as part of the National Medical Device Coalition, which represents approximately 700 manufacturers, has prepared a comprehensive blueprint for FDA reform. Now, the concerns that we express to you today relate directly to FDA enforcement activities that begin with inspection in the field and often result in some type of enforcement implication. In my testimony, I refer specifically to activities relating to FDA inspections, warning letters, recalls, medical device reporting, good manufacturing practices, export certificates, and civil penalties. Each of these topics is laden with negative enforcement overtones which rarely relate to real or potential problems with the expected performance of a device. For example, many warning letters charge violations for which there is little likelihood that FDA would prevail in litigation. And just prior to coming here today, I looked at the agency's history in this area with reference to regulatory letters in 1984 and warning letters in 1994, as well as seizures and injunctions. I won't go into that. But you'll be surprised and impressed with the uh, implication that is associated with the comments that I'm making here, in particular on the implications of warning letters, which I believe are not a good indicator of either compliance or enforcement. It is fair to assume that the public reaction to these communications that I'm referring to warning letters and inspectional observations is to conclude that the FDA is right and the manufacturer is wrong. MEDMA suggests that greater and more candid dialogue between FDA and those who are inspected would stimulate a better understanding and respect for opinion differences as to what is compliance. An atmosphere that encourages sharing as opposed to strident FDA knows best attitude 
would clearly be more beneficial to the consumer than FDA threats. After all, the FDA is not in the business of manufacturing devices. This is what manufacturers do, and they do this superbly. The competitive marketplace demand for the highest quality device is a much greater incentive for manufacturer excellence than any subjective demand by government employees who do not have the daily responsibility to manufacture safe and effective devices. If the FDA would revise current procedures to allow for greater due process as part of the enforcement process, the enforcement decision-making process, there would be much fewer, but possibly better enforcement initiatives. For example, before deciding whether to issue a warning letter or label a responsible activity on the part of a manufacturer as a recall, if the FDA would release less to the public and more to the affected manufacturer before announcing a decision, I believe the administrative record would contain the balance that is essential to responsible decision making. If this is done fairly, I predict that compliance will remain at the highest possible level and FDA enforcement activities will decline substantially. Finally, it is essential to the proper conduct of the FDA that Congress implement the public expectation of responsible oversight. I believe that prior absence of conscientious and balanced oversight by Congress may have contributed to some of the current problems associated with FDA performance. We are pleased with the interests of this subcommittee, the subcommittees, appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and anxious to cooperate with the subcommittees, the FDA, interested members of the public and health profession to accomplish beneficial FDA reform. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pilot. Our next witness is Edward Kimmelman, who is um, an expert in this area with Beringer Mannheim Corporation located in Indianapolis. I also want to thank you, Mr. Kimmelman, for the format you used for your testimony when I was reading it last night. The little summaries off to the left are very helpful in looking at which paragraphs I need to pay close attention to. So, thanks. I will bring that message back to the people who are pushing that format in my company. Thanks for asking me to testify. Um, my company, BMC, is a large manufacturer of in vitro diagnostic products. They're often called IVDs, and I'll refer to them that way. My comments, however, reflect the experience and views of IVD manufacturers, both large and small. I personally have been involved in medical device regulatory affairs since the mid-1970s, when FDA first got into the business of, in earnest of, uh, of uh, regulating me medical devices. Briefly, in vitro diagnostics are products used to test body fluids and tissues that are removed from the human body for testing. I will focus on the effect of informal guidelines on the pre-market clearance of IVDs. The Division of Clinical Laboratory Devices, DCLD, is the FDA division that is responsible for pre-market review of IVDs. While I'm here to testify in support of the petition, I do want to make the point that BMC and its, and its uh, people have worked constructively with the FDA on many issues and they appreciate the professionalism and good intent of the agency personnel. We recognize the theoretical benefits that informal guidance documents can bring to the pre-market review process. Unfortunately, to date, we have experienced the opposite result. This is what we've observed. It is my belief that IVD products are over-regulated, due in part to the use of informal FDA policy and guidance documents. This overregulation subjects these products to a level of pre-market review that is inconsistent with the risk associated with their use and is out of line with the level of review these products get in other parts of the world. FDA's inflexible application of informal guidance documents also leads to overregulation. The uncertainties related to informal guidances have increased review times and costs because they increase the number of review iterations and may result in costly reruns of product evaluations and recalculation of evaluation results. 
The uncertainty introduced by informal guidelines and policies has the added effect of delaying access to new IVD technologies here in the U.S. U.S. patients get the benefit of these technologies months and even years after patients in Europe and other parts of the world. Let me give you two illustrative examples. First, one that affects the IVD industry in general. Triage is a useful guide is useful to guide the application of limited resources to high priority areas. As announced by the FDA, triage, as they were going to use it to determine the intensity of pre-market review, was to be based on risk to patients, with the devices categorized into tiers of increasing risk. In the late 1970s and early 80s, FDA and its advisory panels went through an exhaustive and exhausting, I might add, process of product classification mandated by Congress. This classification process also was based in great measure on risk to patients. Triage, as employed by FDA, is essentially an informal classification system that I believe is duplicative of the legislatively mandated classification process. From a practical point of view, for most medical devices, the triage process yielded results that were consistent with product classifications. Unfortunately, DCLD apparently did not use the triage method as it was intended to be used, resulting in low-risk IVDs being subjected to a level of pre-market review that should be reserved for moderate-risk IVD, moderately-risk devices. In effect, up-classifying them without the benefit of notice and comment. Another major effect of DCLD's approach is to disqualify from exemption many IVDs that truly deserve to be exempted from the 510K submission requirement. In recent months, after much prodding from industry, DCLD has agreed to consider an industry-developed triage approach based primarily on risk. We're encouraged by this. Among the many product-specific examples, let me choose one. Several years ago, FDA developed a guidance document for 510Ks related to cholesterol measurement systems. In January of 1995, buried deep within some handout material, FDA offered to attendees at a video conference related to IVD products was a draft revision of this guidance. This document significantly changed the pre-market submission requirements, including a new performance standard for these products. There was no public announcement of its availability. Several weeks after the video conference, as a test, one of my regulatory affairs specialists requested a copy of the latest FDA guidance document on cholesterol. We received the old version of the guidance document. During the summer of 95, FDA unveiled yet another revision of this guidance document at the AACC meeting, again with no public notice no and no opportunity for input from industry or the practicing laboratory professional community. I offer three suggestions to address our concerns. One, as I mentioned earlier, FDA has begun to work more directly with industry on ways to lighten the review load and speed the pre-market review process. These efforts are beginning to bear fruit and should be encouraged. F two, FDA should implement a quality system for the initiation, development, implementation, and revision of guidelines. FDA should consider working within the consensus mechanisms currently available in standards organizations like NCCLS and AAMI. FDA representatives have for many years worked successfully within these organizations. While the consensus process generally moves slowly, it can be accelerated to accommodate FDA's need for reasonable turnaround of specially needed guidances. Three, already cleared 510Ks would provide guidance as to FDA's current submission requirements. Unfortunately, it takes about 18 to 24 months to obtain sanitized copies of cleared 510Ks through Freedom of Information. Much of the present delay is due to the process used in removing confidential proprietary information. Working with industry, I believe the FDA could develop a means to shorten the freedom of information turnaround time. In closing, 
I reiterate that I support the, the citizen's petition and see it as a way to assure against the imposition of overly stringent pre-market review requirements, which one, delay the introduction of new and beneficial IVD technology, and two, raise the cost of processing pre-market submissions without a commensurate benefit in pr and improved safety and effectiveness of IVDs. We appreciate any opportunity to work with FDA. And speaking for my company, we have demonstrated our willingness to work hard and constructively to achieve practical pre-market review of IVDs. The solutions I propose for IVDs can all be effected without the need for new legislation. They can be accomplished with prudent action by FDA, hopefully, hopefully with effective input of industry. We encourage Congress to continue the oversight efforts of subcommittees like your own. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kimmelman. I appreciate that testimony in coming here today. Um, our next witness on this combined panel is Mr. David Murray. Uh, Mr. Murray and I were colleagues when I was at the Hudson Institute. Uh, he was laying the groundwork for the study that he's going to be describing us, to us today. And I must say that I was delighted to see the end product and of the efforts that you had talked about back then. I think it will make a valuable contribution to an issue that has not gained much attention in this whole area and what are the downside costs in terms of safety and health effects of a regulatory review process. Mr. Murray. Thank you, Chairman McIntosh. And first, let me begin by thanking you for inviting me to testify here today and also to thank Chairman Shays. The testimony that I'm delivering today is the result of research I've carried out as a member of the research staff of the Competitiveness Center of Hudson Institute in Indianapolis. I alone, however, am responsible for the views I express, and they should not be uh, ascribed to Hudson Institute. Medical technology has advanced at an incredible pace during the last 50 years. Physicians and scientists have harvested the fruits of explosive growth in electronics and the material sciences by applying revolutionary advancements in these technologies to medical science. These developments have fed upon one another, creating an environment of synergy and rapid innovation. American consumers have been the ultimate beneficiaries of these technological breakthroughs. Treatments that we take for granted today, such as kidney dialysis, uh, did not exist only a short time ago. Such advancements have benefited literally millions of Americans during the past decades and generated confidence that millions more will live longer and healthier lives in the decades ahead. Although American physicians and scientists have developed most of these innovations in America, American consumers are no longer the first to benefit from these often life-saving and life-enhancing products. All too frequently, Europe, Japan, and Canada approve new medical devices for use years before the Food and Drug Administration approves them for use in the U.S. The delay in introducing these new technologies in America has undeniable and serious consequences for American consumers, consequences that can be quantified in losses in the quality of life, and sometimes even of life itself, for thousands of Americans each year. Proponents of the FDA system argue that these delays are the inescapable price of a system that ensures safety, but really, very little evidence supports this view. The FDA has approved almost all of our, all the medical devices that have encountered serious post-market difficulties worldwide. The evidence that our paper presents indicates that in certain instances, the FDA approval system is actually costing lives. Debates over the safety and efficacy of medical technology often obscure this basic yet vital fact. Rather, the public and the press have been well sensitized to the dangers of premature approval of a medical device or drug. Although pre premature approval is certainly a risk, minimizing this risk comes at the high cost of maximizing another risk that of delaying the entry of safe and effective new technologies with attendant loss of human lives. Conversely, the absence of all regulation would minimize the risk of delaying the availability of new technologies, but would maximize the risk of allowing unsafe or, in or ineffective products to reach the market. Clearly, neither of these extremes is desirable as public policy. The risks of one must be balanced against the risks of the other to find a middle ground. To date, however, warnings about the risk of delayed availability of medical technologies have fallen on deaf ears. Our study examined the regulatory histories of four life-saving, high-tech medical devices that were approved in Europe before they were approved in the U.S. Because each of these devices offered a substantial improvement in the quality of health care for the conditions that they were intended to treat, delays in their approval generated significant human costs. In other words, American consumers could have benefited from these devices earlier had the regulatory approval pro process been more efficient. Let us take the example of the wire leads that are used to connect an implantable defibrillator to the heart. 
A physician can use either epicardial or endocardial, which are transvenous leads, to attach defibrillators to the heart. The clinical evidence in favor of endocardial leads, the transvenous ones, over epicardial leads is extremely strong. A clinical study carried out at 125 participating hospital centers demonstrated that 4.2% of patients receiving the epicardial leads were dead within 30 days following surgery, and only 0.8% of patients receiving the endocardial or transvenous leads died during the same period. Endocardial leads became available in the U.S. in December 1993, but were first widely available in Europe in late 1991, two full years before they were widely available in the U.S. Given the improvements in patient survival for each generation of this device, it is hardly a trivial, it, this is hardly a trivial issue. Roughly 13,200 Americans received defibrillators each year over this period. By delaying their entry into the U.S., American patients were denied access to medical technology that had the potential to save their lives. In fact, our study estimates that the two-year regulatory lag in approving endocardial leads may well have led to over 1,000 deaths in American patients. Similarly, the Cook coronary flex stents presented physicians confronting a life-threatening situation, um, the collapse of an, of an artery during angioplasty, a far better alternative than they otherwise had. Patients who received the stent in clinical trials had up to a 40% chance of a heart attack if the stent had not been used. Indeed, as Dr. Kessler noted upon the stent's approval, quote, it will be helpful for that small group of patients in whom balloon angioplasty might otherwise fail, causing heart attacks or even death, end quote. As a result of regulatory delay, we estimate that up to 2,900 American patients may have lost their lives as a result of the delay. Mr. Chairman, my testimony here today and the report itself are not intended to be attacks <coughs> on the FDA's management or on the FDA itself or the concept of the FDA itself. We agree that medical technology does need to be evaluated before it reaches the market. The purpose of my report is to bring to light the very real costs associated with regulatory delay. Moving slowly and evaluating products may be good policy, but moving too slowly has dramatic human costs that are rarely considered in the policy arena. Without considering these costs, any attempts at enhancing the pre-market review process, such as those being considered before Congress this year, uh, are destined to be disappointing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Murray. I appreciate that testimony. Our next witness on this panel is Mr. Thomas <laughs> Leonard, who is a senior fellow and director of Director of Regulatory Studies in the Progress and Freedom Foundation. Mr. Leonard? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity uh, to discuss the work we're doing at the Progress and Freedom Foundation uh, to look at the effects of our current regulatory process and to develop a new framework for uh, bringing medical products to market. Some of my comments are going to echo some of the themes raised by Mr. Murray and others, and I guess I should also add that the comments that I'm going to be making are my own and not necessarily those uh, of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the United States is currently the world's leader in biomedical research, but uh, this lead is in danger of slipping away because America's procedures for bringing new medical products to patients are among the slowest and most expensive in the developed world. Nowhere is this more true in the, in, than in the medical device industry. Major manufacturers, are, are, major manufacturers increasingly are locating their research and manufacturing facilities offshore, and it is now routine for new medical devices de developed by American companies to be available in other countries before they become available here. This means that American patients are increasingly receiving therapies that are two to three generations behind those available in Europe, for example, and this is solely because of the burdens imposed by the U.S. regulatory system. The current regulatory scheme gives the FDA a statutory mandate to assure that drugs and devices are safe and effective, but this is combined with a monopoly on new, new product approvals. And it's the second part of this framework, the monopoly element, that's the source of the current problems. As long as the only route to the American market is through the FDA, the development of new medical products will continue to be plagued by unnecessary costs and delays and, and the other types of problems that are being discussed here today. Meaningful reform must therefore address the FDA's certification monopoly and introduce competitive pressures into the device approval process. In this respect, as well as others, the new European Union system for regulating medical devices offers important advantages relative to our own and provides a model that we uh, at the group uh, at PFF that's looking at this issue have looked to in developing our own proposals. The European system provides the manufacturer with the option of choosing a private notified body based in any country of the EU to certify that the device meets the essential requirements 
for safety, quality, and performance and to gain entry into the entire EU market. For many simple medical devices, the manufacturer may self-certify compliance. The EU system has been in effect since the beginning of 1993 for active implantable devices since the beginning of 1995 for other medical devices and is soon to be phased in for in vitro diagnostic devices. American medical device companies are well aware of the advantages of the EU system in terms of providing a high degree of predictability that allows for rational planning and investment decisions. American manufacturers who export to Europe are fully subject to the EU system and in recent years many American uh, companies have relocated to Europe and are first introducing their products there. The fact that the EU standards are often very stringent does not seem to dampen the enthusiasm American companies have for the European system. The EU system has a better balance of incentives than our own because much of the detailed work is done by competing private organizations. Many of these organizations have a long history of functioning as independent test houses, test houses, and while in general they guard their reputation for independence carefully, they also have the incentive to help the manufacturer meet the standards needed for expeditious approval as they compete with each other. American companies which deal with both the FDA and the EU systems often remark that the difference is that the notified bodies, quote, want to help. The European system establishes competition at two levels. First, device manufacturers can choose which private notified body they wish to use to bring their product to market, and certification by a notified body in any of the EU countries is sufficient to enter the entire EU market. Second, there's an element of jurisdictional competition because the notified bodies are certified by the competent authorities in their respective countries. This provides an automatic check on any competent authority whose standards become out of line with those elsewhere. The United States could benefit greatly by adopting the best of this system. The establishment of private device certification bodies licensed by the FDA or another competent authority would assure at least one level of competition. Device manufacturers could then choose the most efficient means of obtaining the necessary approval for getting their products to patients. If we don't make fundamental changes along these lines, it seems, that, uh, it seems to me that we're, being, we're in danger of losing much of our medical device industry, which is already voting with its feet in favor of the European system. The ultimate losers, of course, will be American patients whose access to important therapies will be delayed or denied. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonard. I, in the questioning, would like to pursue that notion of competition some more in, in this and other areas. Our final witness on this panel is Dr. Jeffrey Brinker. Uh, welcome, Dr. Brinker, and I look forward to seeing your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am a practicing physician, director of interventional cardiology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and professor of medicine and radiology at the Johns Hopkins University. Over the last six years, I have served on the FDA Circulatory Device Advisory Panel, including two years as its chairman. I have been engaged in the evaluation, regulation, and utilization of medical devices. I am an active member of a number of professional societies, including the American College of Cardiology, the North American Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology, and the Society for Cardiac Angiography and Intervention. I have no financial interest in injury, in industry, or injury for that matter, <laughs> Nor do I have a vested interest in the FDA per se. I did not actively seek the opportunity to speak at this hearing, but accepted the invitation because I believe in this process and thus the responsibility to participate. My prepared testimony outlines general and specific views on the subject of device regulation. In the short time allotted to me, I'd like to highlight them. All of us would agree that society is best served when access to safe, an effective new medical technology is provided in the most, most expeditious fashion. Controversy exists as to how this most effectively and efficiently can be accomplished. While the present system of device regulation has a number of widely acknowledged shortcomings, most of which have been highlighted today, there is much that is right with it. I welcome attention that is directed towards optimizing the system, but urge that we take care not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I would like to emphasize the following. One, there is a need for device regulation, and this should be the responsibility of an impartial, knowledgeable body. 
These products have the potential to cause injury and death, which for some devices may be greater than for many drugs. In addition, device-related injury and failure results in a considerable financial burden to the patient, private insurers, and the government. Two, effective regulation that is not unduly obtrusive may be accomplished under the present system without new law. A number of meaningful changes have taken place at the CDRH over the last six years, which have been directed at facilitating the approval of new technology with particular attention to potentially important advances in medical care. Three, I believe that it is the responsibility of the FDA to facilitate approval of safe and effective medical technology. This involves a change in philosophy, but not of basic mission. I propose that the adversarial relationship between industry and the FDA be replaced with one based on communication and cooperation. Applications should be shepherded through the regulatory system by a continued interactive process. Four, the FDA should have adequate resources to meet demands placed upon it. Towards this end, I recommend the imposition of user fees. Five, the thoughtfully conducted clinical trial remains a cornerstone of device evaluation, especially for technology that claims to offer superior safety or efficacy. Six, patients participating in FDA-sanctioned clinical trials of new devices must be protected from excessive financial burden. Insurers, including the government, should reimburse physicians and hospitals for services rendered, including the cost of the device. A quid pro quo for the insurers might be mandated collection of cost effectiveness data, which would become public domain upon device approval. Seven, there should be a way for FDA sanction of investigator-initiated studies of off-label device use, such that approval for valid indications may be introduced into the labeling. Eight, while I would not suggest that there is a medical-industrial complex, I do think that the objectivity of manufacturers and some physicians may be clouded by economic factors as well as by an intellectual commitment to the technology. I would like to remind all of us that new cannot be equated with better. Few, if any, of the devices that have passed through the circulatory advisory panel over the last six years were presented with any demonstrable benefit in terms of life saved compared to available alternative therapy. I do not feel that the conclusions drawn by the Hudson report are scientifically valid. In fact, I am convinced that the regulatory process imposed by the FDA has saved lives by insisting on important preclinical qualification and a limited initial clinical experience. Furthermore, in these days of limited financial resources for health care, I think it an absolute necessity that new technology demonstrate at least clinical effectiveness, if not cost effectiveness. In conclusion, I think that the quality of medical care in the United States is the finest in the world. We provide the greatest number of our population with the most advanced technology in an expeditious manner. I am not against change, but feel that it should be taken for the right reasons with reasonable expectations that the end result will be an improvement for our greater society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brinker. Uh, let me turn now uh, to my colleague from Indiana, Mr. Souter, and then I'll reserve my questioning to go after him since he's been very patiently waiting. Uh, Mr. Souter, do you have any questions for the panel? <clears throat> yeah, let me ask a few and I'll go back to you and may have a couple more later too. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Brinker, I was confused uh, by a couple things. One is, is that uh, is cost effectiveness currently a test? For the FDA? Yes. No. And you're suggesting that that might be a no, criteria? No, I'm saying that effect effectiveness should be. I'm saying in the future, at someday, by legislation, cost effectiveness probably will be. <coughs> but uh, a device now has to be proved safe and effective. I think that any variance from the necessity to prove a device safe and effective, and I underline the term effective, would, would be uh, a burden that shouldn't, uh, uh, our society shouldn't have to bear. If you, if you believe that part of it is to prove uh, clinical effectiveness, and if, in effect, if a product that's supposed to be life-saving is effective, why wouldn't accelerating the process of approval save lives? And why wouldn't slowing down that process cost lives? Why would you question the Hudson? 
I, I question the Hudson report only in the, some of the conclusions that it, it draws. If a device can be proven safe and effective, then I think the time when that, the, when that proof is obvious, scientifically valid and accepted till the time that it is available on the marketplace should be as short as possible a day, two days, whatever it's necessary to, to train physicians in the proper use and to uh, establish proper directions and labeling. I think the problem comes in the time it takes to establish with valid scientific proof that a device is safe and effective. And some of the devices that we've discussed today are, are, not, are still controversial. Some of the devices that have been approved um, have been shown in retrospect not to be safe and effective. Uh, and some of the devices that never get to the FDA process because they are, are piloted in Europe um, are not safe and effective. Uh, Could you? gentlemen yield for one sure. second on that? And let me make sure I understand that last remark. You're saying up until the point where it can be proved to somebody's satisfaction that it is safe and effective, there should be no consideration of how much time is taken? No, I don't say that. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think I said that. I, I said that the clock should start on excess time for a device that is safe and effective when it is proven to be safe and effective. I think that expeditious and, and review... What happens prior to that? What should your standard be in terms of watching the clock? Well, I think that all, all of these um, uh, devices should be brought through the process as quickly as possible with regard to patient safety. Um, the problem, and I've been uh, able to look at some of these uh, issues, the problem is that uh, many of these devices, including implantable devices, and I underline that clearly because taking out implantable devices is, is, a, is a terrible thing. We're trying to do that right now with a pacemaker lead. It affects 45,000 people in the world, 25,000 in the U.S., and it has the, the un, unfortunate uh, defect uh, which might result in the sudden death of people. Unfortunately, extracting the lead can result in more deaths uh, at a higher rate of deaths at least. So we're in a quandary of how to do this. It is not clear that stents over a period of time would be safe and effective. Uh, in fact, when the, uh, the Cook stent was presented to the FDA panel, um, while it appeared to uh, be able to reduce the incidence of um, emergency surgery and myocardial infarction, there was no statistical difference from control data, which was historical controls, that there was any resultant um, saving of lives. Uh, even after approval, uh, a number of papers in respected scientific journals question whether the uh, Cook bailout stent is the most effective way of, of um, approaching patients with acute occlusion of a coronary vessel. These are not slam dunk uh, um, endpoints once they get through the FDA even. Um, I agree with everything that's been said about getting good things through the FDA. I think that there are, there are hang-ups at multiple parts of the process. I also believe that many of the hang-ups are due to the in industry and their physician investigators. There's a feeling of infallibility on the part of uh, doctors who back some of these devices. There are economic and tunnel vision problems with uh, manufacturers. The poor studies are done. Um, in fact, most of the studies that were done when I first came on the FDA panel were inappropriate for us to evaluate for scientific validity. There were no proper questions asked. There were no proper conclusions drawn. Were improper data. The patients were enrolled incorrectly. But, and, but let's uh, assume we have a device that works, and you're saying that all of the prospective patients have to bear the cost of that of the fact that there's a scientific review panel that's not happy with the data. No, no, I'm not saying that. I said, you, to, 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 to well, you, you, are you, you saying you they start should go ahead the, and be available then? You, no, you start, okay. with the, you start with the premise that you have a device that works. What I would ask as a physician who is going to use that device is to, is to just prove to me that it works and that it's safe so that when I give it to a patient, 
that I'm not going to kill them. I've seen patients die with devices. I've killed patients with devices. Some of the devices were good. Some of them were not good. Some of the indications were not clear. This is not a, 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 a black and white answer to these problems. But I think that we can't accept less than a reasonable indication that the device is safe and effective. I think that should be done as quickly as possible, but I think it should be done. And I think that industry and the FDA together should be held to the fire. Very often, industry shoots itself in the foot un unbeknownst to them. So I, I think we agree uh, on that general principle. I'll yield the time back. I, I'd, I'd like to. In Time really isn't as of critical nature when, with the two of us here. That um, the, uh, uh, as I understand the basic construct, and I'd like to have uh, David <coughs> Murray elaborate a little bit more on this, and then anybody else who wants to pick up, that we we don't disagree on bad devices because we don't want to put anything out that is clearly harmful with little redeeming value. And we have very little disagreement on things that clearly work. We need an accelerated process, and the only disagreement there may be how we make sure we identify those at the most rapid rate possible. The real question is in the mixed group. In other words, they have redeeming, uh, pot potentially redeeming uh, benefits, potentially harmful benefits versus the person may have a condition that's harmful in and of itself. They may die whether or not they get the device. And that's really the area and how big that area is that we're in dispute of. Is, is that not correct? And, and we can come back to Dr. Brinker, but let's hear from a couple of the others, too, uh, with that. I think that's, um, let me say first, I'm encouraged to hear that um, we should look to uh, having a reasonable assurance of, of safety and effectiveness. And I think actually that's what our study does. Our study, the excess lag times in our study, are the clock only starts <coughs> after the device was approved abroad by a competent authority, either through the European community-wide uh, process, depending on the device, or through an independent country. Remember who we're talking about here. We're talking about European countries such as Germany, England, etc. These are governments, you know, first world countries who have uh, meaningful processes, processes, processes and the new community-wide um, regulations are certainly meaningful and, and coherent. So to say that, I, what I'm saying is, is that by approval in Europe, I think that does give us a reasonable assurance of safety uh, and indeed efficacy. Can I, can I ask you a couple questions related to that and you can think sure. that is there a difference in the European, I assume from what I've read, that there's a difference in the Europeans make more risk awareness notification to their consumers and tell you that they're, there may be, it may not be completely sure or whatever they have, and we don't have that in America. In other words, what I understood us saying is, is that we hold these things until we're clear that over a number of years uh, they're, they're safe, whereas in Europe they put them on the market if there's a probable indication and people are aware. Is there a difference in the standards? The, the systems really are, are so different, they're almost not comparable. However, the European system does hold devices to qualities. There are standards and specifications that devices are built to. They are reviewed. There, are, there is clinical review for implantable devices, for high-risk devices. The devices are classified in a manner similar to which they are classified under the FDA system. To say that the European system does not uh, deal with safety or clinical evidence would, would be misleading. Um, what we recommend is we move uh, towards a European style system, which indeed the track record shows that the number of devices approved in Europe that have come back to hurt people that have not been approved in the U.S. are uh, very small. As a matter of fact, FDA was asked that question in an appropriations hearing this spring. The only device they could come up with was one that was approved uh, 15 years ago before the community-wide regulations were in place and when uh, regulation by national governments was only in its infancy in Europe. So what you're saying is, is that of the, dr uh, of the devices that have been held up in this country that have been improved in Europe, the only one that they came up with uh, was early on in the process and not, it, did it, was it a high risk? Yes, device? it was a high risk device. That I'm speaking in terms of high risk devices. Okay. And did it, and that, uh, did the FDA discover that that one device that they, I mean, could you the elaborate? The FDA did not approve it. Okay. Um, does anybody else want to comment on the earlier ex exchanges of points of Dr. Brinker? Well, I'd like to offer an observation uh, from the perspective of uh, the manufacturer, in particular the entrepreneur, because I don't know of uh, any manufacturer, large or small, 
that undertakes to generate income from the sale of devices so that that income then can be used to support plaintiff's attorneys in products liability litigation. And that would be the logical outcome of some of the statements that Dr. Brinker suggests, that uh, industry is irresponsible to this approach. The FDA has a responsibility for these pre-market approval types of devices to assure reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. That's the statutory criteria by virtue of valid scientific evidence. And the types of devices that Br Dr. Brinker is referring to are those that are generally subject to intervention by a licensed practitioner, a qualified surgeon, a qualified physician, a therapist, a licensed practitioner who functions between the patient and the device itself. And it's oftentimes the skill and the judgment of that practitioner which determines the success of the outcome. Now, you made a reference to uh, ex acceptance or knowledge in the European system as part of your question. I believe that risk acceptance is part of the equation and that better communication between practitioners and those who are subject to the, subjected to the use of a device will uh, provide the type of benefit that consumers are looking for and the participation that they deserve. But to suggest that uh, the, the present system doesn't, doesn't uh, justify some type of modifications, I, I don't agree with Dr. Brinker's statement on that. And it also has some serious questions about the role of the advisory committees and, frankly, the manipulation of the advisory committees by FDA staff. I didn't address any of that in my comments, but that is a subject that is very important. I believe in third-party review, but uh, I question the agency's management of that process. Let, let me turn now to something in Mr. Leonard's testimony about the European feature, and that was the concept of competition among different possible entities that can grant approval. Do a lot of these problems of bo the, both in terms of, of kind of secret policy guidance being developed by the agencies and the failure to respond quickly to the potential of a new device, do those things fall out in a competitive system? And if so, what are the what are the potential downsides in terms of perhaps more risky products being put onto the market? And is there any way to quantify the, those those trade-offs if we were considering policy options? Well, I mean, I think I think I think a lot of the bad effects that you're talking about do fall out as a result of the competition. First, I should say that the European system is relatively new. So there's not a lot of experience with it. But it has been in effect for more than two years with the most risky class of devices, the active implantable, the active implantable devices. And there's no evidence at all that, uh, that I can see that they, that, that they have bought a, uh, a more responsive, more efficient, and quicker system at the cost of higher risk. It just doesn't seem to be any evidence that, of that at all. They seem to have bought a, a more responsive and, and more efficient system without any increase in risk. The standards they have are quite stringent. They're not easy standards. Uh, uh, the notified bodies, uh, the private uh, notified bodies compete with each other, but they all have reputations that they want to protect in terms of the fact that their certification actually means something. In addition to that, uh, in addition to that the, the national competent authorities supervise quite closely. But it's, a, but it's really an entirely different system than our own. Uh, uh, and, and the notified bodies are very, are very uh, cognizant of the fact that they both have to, have, to, they, they have to make sure that their certification means something. They have to satisfy their competent authority. But they also have to get business. And they have to retain business. So they have to satisfy their customers. In, any comments from any of the other eight panelists on, on the no, this notion of competition as a possible way of, of improving the regulatory system. Dr. Brinker. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to address that, that one question. Um, I, I feel that, that uh, we should all be open to potential changes that might make any system better. Um, competition. Uh, and let, let me take, digress a second and say that the, the European system in many countries was almost no system for regulation of devices until very recently. And in fact, they've tended to, from, from some, uh, especially some very lax states, 
uh, countries to to become more stringent um, using the FDA as a model, having talked to a number of physicians and regulators, so that where they are now, for for a, in a great measure, uh, for many of the countries at least um, in this union, is, is is stricter than where they were five, six, ten years ago. Uh, and, and so, do you think the presence of of a competing entity allows them to be stricter but, but more efficient in processing the application? Well, I think that they have a number of, of, of I think they're coming from a, a, a scenario where they were less strict so that it's easier to go into an area where we'll, we'll be a little bit more strict but we'll, we'll give this um, um, uh, method of of uh, compensation, and that is that you can deal with um, competitive uh, device uh, regulatory bodies. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether that would be an effective way. I don't know whether we would, for instance, like the FCC to, uh, or the FAA or any of the other commissions to be uh, really a number of competitive private enterprises running them uh, so that new airplane, uh, new computerization of, uh, of uh, flight paths and new engines uh, would be under uh, any one of a number of uh, uh, competitive bodies. I don't know whether that could work. It might, um, and uh, if it could, uh, and it would work better than the system we have now, I would support it. If the system could be, that we have now could be fixed, and I personally think it could, and I think it could be changed uh, for the better, I think that there's a lot to recommend it. The, the, the first thing to recommend it is a feeling of impartiality. This, this institution, the FDA, doesn't have to compete for, for, for business. And, and there are certain benefits of not competing for business, one of which is you don't have to give the impression that you do something better for the company that might not be better for society as a whole. Um, I think there would have to be a whole unique new set of regulations for these bodies, for instance, to make sure that they go along with the strict guidelines that the FDA employees have to have about uh, associations with industry and, and, and uh, uh, things of that nature. So I, I think that this would open up a whole new uh, bag of worms, and I'm not against doing that. And I, I hope my testimony, I hope the members of the panel read my written testimony. Nowhere does it say that I'm not for change. Um, I also would like to take, uh, take exception of the term that uh, it's, it's really the doctors. Uh, you know, devices don't kill patients. Doctors who use them do. I've heard that said before. I'd like guns don't kill people. Um, uh, people kill people. And to a certain extent, that's true. Uh, but there is a responsibility that the device manufacturer has to ensure that the devices are properly labeled, that the indications are clear, that adjunctive medication is, is obvious, and that physicians are trained appropriately. Um, and, 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 that, and I think that's a battle with some other people because I think all of us would agree we want to make sure we've got the right information in the hands of the people using these devices so that they can do the best possible But, but that's job. part of the regula regulatory process because the FDA, as, as part of the approval process, mandates those things. Mandates, in fact, certain physician training uh, and certainly the labeling. Assuming they get it right. I mean, that, that, that's helpful. The, let me switch tack slightly and, and ask a, diff a different question. Uh, one alternative method other than competition is to try to build more accountability into the agency actions. And I asked the agency to think about and comment, and we didn't get back to it. So I'll, hopefully they'll do it in their written responses. What about incorporating into their approval process uh, a postmortem that measures how long it took, how many lives were lost, what's the, the downside for the fact that we had to go through this approval process, and over time building a, a body of information that says, yes, roughly to, in order when we've got a, a high-risk device, we know it's going to take longer, and, and this is within the norm of what we think it takes. We're willing to accept that in society because we're weeding out the riskier devices. Um, Low-risk devices had uh, less of a potential harm for the delay, but also less potential risk, and so that was an area. Do, 
would that type of accountability for each of the individual decisions be something that would be helpful in this process? And I'll throw that open to anyone on the panel. Uh, well, I believe over time it would be useful to have that information to analyze what the um, result of a regulatory process is. And I believe those opportunities exist now for the agency. And in my comments, I talked about uh, medical device reports, for example, where manufacturers are expected to supply information to the agency as it relates to death, serious injury, or malfunction. And in the last two years, over 200,000 of those reports have been transmitted to the agency. And the agency recognizes those as accomplishments, processing all this paperwork. But I have asked the question repeatedly, what is the preventative benefit that comes out of all of that? Since 1984, the agency has been managing this program and expecting manufacturers to supply information to the uh, agency. Presumably, it's evaluated for some public health benefit reason that you can tie into prevention. But I've yet to receive an explanation. I'm not the only one asking this question. Certainly, it's a question that Congress needs to ask. What is the benefit of some of these programs that you have in place? I'd like to comment on the reference to competition. And uh, without getting into a definition, but assuming that competition is a reference to toward the direction of excellence, excellence, and not compromised by some other activity, I believe in the United <coughs> States we could benefit from some type of third-party review system at the option of the manufacturer. For example, if the FDA were to recognize Johns Hopkins for some particular expertise that they have, and if Johns Hopkins were interested in applying that expertise to the review process, as a manufacturer, I could go to Johns Hopkins and I could ask them to review my clinical data in support of safety and effectiveness. If they give me an, a thumbs up, I would take that to the agency and that would function as the scientific review process in lieu of FDA bureaucrats managing the process. So I think uh, if, if you're talking about competition in that sense, that's certainly something that uh, MEDMA and the uh, NMDC support. But on the, ter on the uh, reference to analysis, I believe it's important to do that. But we have tons, loads, lots of paperwork that the agency can use now to evaluate its performance. We talked about warning letters and the reference list. And again, I take my shots at the warning letter because I don't think it's helpful to anybody to have those issued under the present system. The number of warning letters issued in relation to regulatory letters over the 10-year period of time have gone up 20-fold, I believe. Yet the number of seizures and injunctions that the agency has pursued during that period of time remains the same. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that point. No, my thought was when they finally issue an approval on a device, they make as part of their announcement, we have calculated it. It's taken us five years to go through this process. There were 10 people who died each year. That's 50 people who died as a result of this approval process. But we think it's worth it because you have to take a certain amount of time to do it. Now, if they had to justify those numbers each time they made a decision, I think they'd try to minimize it as much as possible and in order to not look bad when they go to the press and now make a positive announcement about a new device. And I would hope on a regular basis, if there were that type of system, that uh, Congress through oversight would, uh, on a yearly basis or whenever, review the agency's performance. See how they're doing. Is there, <clears throat> is there a current method to, um, uh, when a product is hitting a market void, in other words, it's an innovative product that could actually save lives of which nothing exists currently in the market uh, so that it is clearly um, more likely to be a net gain and the risk might be worth it, in other words, a higher percentage of the people. Is there any sorting process that would accelerate that type of application? Perhaps better judgment on the part of the okay. agency. but. The, uh, the FDA has implicated over the last uh, at least two years that I know of a breakthrough <coughs> um, a device, a fast track, which actually Burlington um, described very briefly this, this morning. And this has been used. And in the, in the advisory panel, at least the circulatory advisory panel, which I think is good and not manipulated by the FDA, um, has, has advocated a fast track approval of at least two devices that we reviewed, one being the non-fluorocotomy leads um, and the other being the stents. Let me, at this point, if I might, uh, turn to the Minority Council, since there are no minority members present, 
and, and ask Kevin, do you have any questions for any of the panel members? Yes, please. Okay. Come forward and introduce yourself and go ahead and ask those questions. Hi, Kevin Davis, uh, Minority Professional Staff, Government Reform and Oversight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Murray, has your report undergone peer review outside of the Hudson Institute? And if not, isn't that a standard practice where you have a report which makes uh, serious allegations that FDA delays have led to hundreds of deaths? Yes, it has undergone peer review outside of the Hudson Institute. Um, no, it's not necessarily a standard uh, function uh, in think tanks or academic papers. Um, generally, that function is carried out by, if it's going to be published in a third party journal, such as a medical journal or a law journal, something to that effect, it's generally done at that level. But when it's being published uh, privately, that's not always done, although sometimes it is. Um, I would also point out that all the clinical data that's contained in the report came from refereed medical journals, and those articles in turn are peer reviewed by, uh, by physicians. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, as you know, guidance documents are often desired by device manufacturers to clarify statutory or regulatory requirements. Are you concerned that requiring notice and comment for guidance documents would lengthen the amount of time that it would take for the FDA to respond to industry's need for guidance? Um, I tried to um, make clear that the FDA has mischaracterized my petition as requiring or our petition as requiring notice and comment for guidance documents. That simply isn't true. We don't even suggest that guidance documents undergo notice and comment rulemaking. What we suggest is that substantive rules and interpretive rules undergo notice and comment rulemaking. The vast majority of guidance documents don't contain either of those categories of information. And for those, we suggest good guidance practices. Good guidance practices, as we defined it, are something much short of notice and comment rulemaking, um, but nonetheless designed or calculated to get the appropriate amount of public input. Um, so we don't have that fear that it will slow down the process. Thank you. And just one last question for Mr. Thompson. Uh, in Mr. Leonard's testimony, he suggests that uh, many American firms are relocating their facilities to other countries where the regulatory climate is more favorable. Uh, are you aware of this happening with any Indiana firms? Um, I understand just anecdotally or, 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 or I should say through rumor about it happening. I have not systematically surveyed our membership to find out um, what's going on. The Health Industry Manufacturers Association did do a nationwide survey that included Indiana companies and found a significant um, problem in that regard and that would include, I suppose, Indiana. But we didn't do an independent survey. Where are the results of that research available? Uh, from the health industry manufacturers. It's the, uh, I'm sure if you called uh, HIMA, uh, they would provide you with a copy. It's uh, the Wilkerson Report. Um, it was just released a couple of months ago. And uh, if they won't, uh, give me a call and I'll get you a copy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for uh, coming today. It's obviously a very difficult issue, and I think one of the points that we're hoping to bring out is that there are risks both directions. Uh, risk uh, if you don't have the devices on the market, and risk if you do have the devices on the market. And there are concerns if we accelerate it too fast, it is tough to take the devices back out. And we have to be careful uh, as we make the changes uh, in, in one direction, not to overcompensate that way also, but I'm really pleased with the Hudson survey that is beginning to have a breakthrough to show there's our risks uh, on both sides of the equation by delays and, and holding up things as well as by accelerating. Do you want to make a comment, Mr. Just Kimball? One last comment. Um, I think you'll find the same kind of information in this Wilkerson report in, in, in a very dramatic way. Uh, uh, there are over a hundred specific examples of of uh, useful medical devices that are available elsewhere in the world, but not yet available in the United States, and uh, so that you can you can enter that into the mix also. Thank you very much. I want to thank the staff of both subcommittees, uh, and thank you all for coming. And the hearing is now adjourned.
Live today on C-SPAN, the sixth day of hearings on the 1992 Ruby Ridge incident in northern Idaho. The Senate Judiciary Subcommittee is looking into the events that resulted in the deaths of Randy Weaver's wife, Vicki, their son, and a federal marshal. That's at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 7 Pacific, here on C-SPAN. Saturday night on C-SPAN, the Lee Atwater Foundation honors House Speaker Newt Gingrich. The group held the event this week in Washington.